Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the uh, September 11th, 2018 Board of Commissioners meeting. And this morning, uh, we're going to have uh, Commissioner Bob Weatherford lead us in uh, an invocation, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance. And then after that, we'll do a moment of uh, silence for, uh, for the victims of 9-11. So those who are willing and able, please stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and its many blessings. We thank you for all that you give us in this country that we call the United States. We ask that you bless those in attendance. You give those of us up here in leadership guidance, give us the clarity of thought, the strength of our hearts, and the perseverance of our liberties. God, and protect all, and on this day, Remember all of those that gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we may enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy today. For these things I ask in your son's name. Amen. 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 Officer. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for and then for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. All right, so we have a number of presentations this morning. I'm going to let Commissioner Burrow, we have a small, we're just going to change the sequence slightly. We're going to start with the uh, daughter, Daughters of Republican Women first or Daughters of American Revolution? Okay, so I'll let Commissioner Burrow lead uh, the Cobb Republican Women's and the Daughters of Revolution Constitution Week. Good morning, everyone. I have the honor of, <clears throat> excuse me, presenting a proclamation to uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution and also Cobb Republican Women's Club for Constitution Day, which is uh, September 17th. And this is our meeting, only meeting before then that we, um, we do this every year. And um, I'd like to ask them both, both groups to come up. And if I could have Cobb Republican Women on the left and DAR on the right. Next week begins Constitution Week. And I think it's very fitting that today on 9-11 we um, are recognizing these wonderful ladies and all they've done to keep our Constitution reminded in our schools and in the public's eye. Uh, the first two ladies here, Millie, Millie, come up, and Barbara Hickey, are the co-founders of Constitution Day for Cobb Republican Women. And um, every year they go to the schools and deliver constitutions to all the Cobb County schools and Marietta City schools for fifth graders. So um, I will start with their proclamation first, if I may. Actually, I'm gonna do the Daughters of the American Revolution because they started Constitution Day. Hi, how are you? Um, good morning, ladies. Good morning. Okay. Constitution Week is the commemoration of America's most important document and is celebrated the week of September 17th through the 23rd. It will be the 231st anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution on September 17, 2018. The United States Constitution is a symbol of the tenacity Americans have displayed throughout history to maintain our liberties, freedoms, and inalienable rights. 
And whereas the celebration of the Constitution was started by the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1955, Daughters of the American Revolution petitioned Congress to set aside September 17th through the 23rd annually to be dedicated for the observance of Constitution Week. The resolution was later signed into law by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And whereas the purpose of Constitution Week celebration is to emphasize citizens' responsibilities for protecting and defending the Constitution, inform people that this important document is the foundation of our way of life, and encourage study and historic of the historical events that led to the framing of the Constitution in September 1787. And whereas the Daughters of the American Revolution also built a structure in tribute to the Constitution of the United States, Constitution Hall, which is a performing arts center, opened in 1929. Now, therefore, we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim September 17th through the 23rd, 2018, as Constitution Week in Cobb County, and thank the Daughters of the American Revolution for its tireless advocacy on behalf of all citizens. We encourage all residents to learn more about this important document and celebrate the freedoms it affords us. This is the 11th day of September, 2018. And we have Ann. Ann Amy, Vice Regent of our chapter. Joan Bloom. Vicki Hoffman, Chaplain. Thank you, ladies, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great group we have today of ladies on my right and left. Um, I'm, this basically says a lot of what the DAR proclamation says, but I want to emphasize what you ladies have done for our schools in getting the word out about our Constitution and every year um, through your funding distribute Constitution booklets throughout um, all the fifth graders in Cobb and Marietta City Schools. So we have the two founders of Constitution Day for Cobb Republican Women, Barbara Hickey, Melanie Rogers, Roseanne Hall, Babe Atkins Burns, Rose Wing, Cheryl Lenny, Dorothy Baskin, Baskin I want, I'm sorry, and Lori Chastain. Thank you ladies for being here. And if you want to hold this picture, I mean this proclamation, and scoot over here for a picture. Did you ever look at it for the best? Yeah, yeah, let them come up here. And remember, September 17th. Thank you. Okay, am I going to stand down here for Davis? Yes. <clears throat> and now, uh, Bishop Burrell is going to give a presentation to the Davis Elementary School uh, PTA. Okay, could I have the Davis Elementary representatives? School board member David Banks and the PTA from Davis. <clears throat> this is a great honor to have one of our Cobb County Elementary Schools receive this national recognition from the National Parent Teacher Association. They have recognized Davis Elementary and Davis Elementary PTA as a 2018-2020 School of Excellence for their commitment to building an inclusive and welcoming school community. Congratulations. Thank you for being here, David. Um, I'm gonna read the proclamation and then if y'all have anything you'd like to say, we're very proud of Davis today and I, every day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Whereas the National Parent Teacher Association has recognized W.M. Davis Elementary 
and Davis Elementary PTA as a 2018-2020 School of Excellence for their commitment to building an inclusive and welcoming school community where all families contribute to enriching the educational experience and overall well-being for all students. And whereas founded in 1897 as the National Congress of Mothers, National PTA is a powerful voice for all children, a relevant resource for families and communities, and a strong advocate for public education. W.M. Davis Elementary and Davis Elementary PTA are, only, are one of only 278 PTAs in schools nationwide recognized as a 2018 to 2020 School of Excellence. And whereas National PTA School of Excellence program helps PTAs become partners in identifying and implementing school improvement initiatives based on PTA's national standards for family school partnerships. Schools that exhibit improvement at the end of the school year are honored as a National PTA School of Excellence, a distinction that spans two years. This award recognizes the efforts of all the volunteers and families who work together to help strengthen relationships at our school. Davis PTA hopes to continue building an environment where all families feel welcomed and empowered. The success of their students the number one prior is the number one priority, and whereas PTA's mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. <clears throat> PTA values collaboration, commitment, diversity, respect, and accountability. And therefore, we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby congratulate Davis Elementary School and Davis Elementary PTA for being recognized as a 2018-2020 School of Excellence. We wish the school and the PTA success as they continue to support an enriching education for the students in our community. This is the 11th day of September, 2018. Well, I have to say I've never done this before in my district, so it's great to have Davis and Davis PTA up here. And we did two proclamations so that the school can keep one and the PTA can keep one. I'm the proud principal of Davis Elementary, Kristen Herb and I'd just like to say um, thank you to the Cobb, um, Cobb County government, Cobb School District representatives here, and our PTA. I think we're a fine example of how communities can all work together to make a dynamic and important partnership between parents and the school, and it's all for the kids. Amen. <laughs> Mr. Banks, would you like to say a few words? I also want to say congratulations to the Davis Elementary School and the community. And I also want to say this just doesn't happen. This is earned. And I want to congratulate the principal for her leadership and the staff that she has for their leadership and for the PTAs and for the teachers and for the community. This is a great honor and we appreciate it. And thank you for doing an excellent job in representing the Cobb County School System. Thank you. And now uh, Commissioner Weatherford has a uh, presentation on uh, library card sign-up month for Cobb County. It's a modern day to present a proclamation for uh, Cobb County Public Libraries. And I know Helen Poyers here. Is anyone else representing libraries come forward, please? Oh, there's a whole back row. All right. Someone's not in school. <laughs> Hi. Well, 
Well, many of you uh, know our libraries and the quality of life that they provide to the citizens of Cobb County. You also know some of the uh, very uh, important uh, supporters of the library have been coming for us for months and months and months, uh, proclaiming what we need to do to keep that going. I'm happy to say that that's in the works and things are picking up in the library system. And today is uh, Cobb County Public Library. Uh, Library Card Week, or day, I guess. Now let me read this proclamation. Whereas the libraries play important roles for education, economic development, communication, recreation, and the health and safety of the community, and whereas a library card is the most important school supply for all the children and support lifelong learning, and Cobb Library Program serves students of all ages from early literacy to homework help to GED classes, and whereas public libraries empower all people to pursue their interests, discover their passions, and achieve their highest potential as learners and citizens, and whereas libraries bring communities together, creating welcoming and inclusive spaces for people of all backgrounds to learn and explore the world together, and whereas Cobb libraries are constantly transforming and expanding their services to meet the needs of the community that serves model programs on technology, health, finance, and workforce development. And whereas Cobb libraries are recognized for innovations shared with peers across the United States, including the Library Pass, which is public library access for student success, offering library resources for students simply using their student ID numbers, programs on health and well-being, technology, and more. Libraries promote equity, making digital technology and information equally accessible to all. Now we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim September is Library Sign-Up Month in Cobb County and urge each citizen to come in its observance this 11th day of September, 2018. There you go. Thank you. And? Do you have your card? Oh. <laughs> is that another one? Okay, I lost my last one. I had to go get some yesterday. Can I have that one too? What if I lose this one? Well, they put me through a lot to just get a replacement. I just want you to know that. I tried everything, pulled strings, nothing worked. It is, okay. All right. Get your card now. All right. Tell us a little bit. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And that library card is the most valuable card in your wallet. It provides access to a wealth of resources available to all citizens. Over 60% of Cobb's population have library cards. And you heard about the PASS program, 120,000 children in Marietta and Cobb schools have access to our resources through the use of their student ID. And we have our young visitors here. We have Jesse and we have Judah who completed, a well, Judah has completed 1,000 books before kindergarten, so he's ready to start. <laughs> And Jesse is on his way to being a graduate as well. And so we're happy that Susan, who is the mom, uh, encourages her children to read. And I'm going to pass it on to our, our uh, attendees here. We have our trustees and some staff members. But if you don't have a library card, we are doing pop-up library card sign-up throughout the county. And we will show that list in just a minute. So I'm going to turn it over to Abby. I'd like to thank all of you. We have a fab, phenomenal staff, and we can't do it without our staff. I'm a part of the Library Board of Trustees, and just want to let you know that, yes, there's so many more resources that you can access with your library card. You can get educational classes. Um, there's downloading videos, downloading e-readers. There's so much more than just books, as well as the, a lot of the new um, stuff going on in a lot of the libraries. So I, I encourage you to go. Um, we also have the library book sale coming up at the Cobb County um, the Civic Center in October, October 12th, that weekend. So everybody, it's open to the public, as well as our library foundation has a fundraiser coming up as a gala coming up on September 20th at the uh, new Sewell Mill Cultural Arts Center and Library. So um, we welcome everybody to that and go to the library website and we have our board, some of our board members here as well as wonderful staff. So I just wanna thank you. Thank you, thank you. If you haven't taken advantage of some of the newer libraries like Sewell Mill and the regional libraries and ones that we're building, 
you'll notice there are a lot of other innovative things in there, like 3D printers, for example, and music studios where you can actually record your own music. So take a, take a time and stop by and take a look at all that they have to offer. And congratulations for a job well done and what you do for our county. So thank you. I think we built that library for that young man. A thousand books before kindergarten. That's truly a remarkable achievement. I'm still working on that now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, invite Wendy Carboda and uh, Susan and whoever the other supporters for uh, this proclamation on uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. story behind this uh, proclamation that'll be in my book. <laughs> we'll be the first one. To yes, you will. Oh, Thank you. I appreciate case. that. <laughs> uh, whereas cancer kills more children than any other disease that affects kids combined, according to the nonprofit cancer organization, and this occurrence of childhood cancer is on the rise, increasing by about 29% over the last 20 years. And whereas nearly 16,000 children in the United States of America are diagnosed with cancer every year, one in 285 children will be diagnosed with this disease before the age of 20. Even with this steady rise, fewer than five drugs have been developed specifically for childhood, for children with cancer since 1980, compared to hundreds of drugs developed specifically for adults. And whereas, on average, pediatric hospitalization for cancer are almost five times more costly than hospitalizations for any other pediatric condition, and whereas less than 4% of the National Cancer Institute's research budgets aimed at solving childhood cancer, the cause of most ca childhood cancers are unknown, and the diseases cannot concurrently be prevented. Therefore, increasing funding and excelling research are vital. Now, therefore, we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby recognize September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and encourage all residents to help support children and families affected by cancer this 11th day of September, 2018. There you are. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Boyce and Cobb County Commission. We are so grateful for this opportunity to raise awareness for childhood cancer awareness. September globally is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And yes, we are you are all now aware because you now know someone who has been affected by childhood cancer. We are here, here today with a call to action for all of you, especially our schools and our libraries, anybody that cares about children. If children are gold to you, like they are to us, then please go gold for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. We all know what pink means, and we all know that when people are affected by pink and they see it on the football fields and the baseball fields and the buildings and the White House, that they're cared for and that they're supported. Gold, gold ribbons are the color that we wear and that we wish to light the cities and countries and the world up in September to tell our children that we appreciate the battle that they go through and they don't have they don't have a lot of weaponry. They really don't. There are currently 900 drugs in the pipeline for adults and adult cancer. There are three for children. Childhood cancer is the leading cause of death amongst children. Imagine that. And there's only three drugs for them. The last thing I want you to be aware of is something that childhood cancer families know all too well, and that's the word NED, or remission. NED stands for no evidence of disease. It is rare to find a family 
of childhood cancer survivors that say that their child is cured. They will say they're in remission or there's no evidence of disease. But because children have to use the drugs that adults are receiving, in toddlers and infants, the effects of these drugs last a lifetime. So 95% of all childhood cancer survivals will suffer late effects later on in life. They will have chronic diseases by the time they're 40, mostly cardi cardiac. So our call to action is to please, if you're going to donate, and we hope that you do, look for a childhood cancer foundation, such as Cure Childhood Cancer or Rally, that are based in Atlanta, and all their funding 100% goes to childhood cancer funding, research funding. We donated $5 to the American Cancer Society. Two cents of that $5 will be allocated towards childhood cancer research. Buy a light bulb and put it on your porch in gold and let everybody know that you support childhood cancer awareness. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, on the public comment, uh, Ms. Dance. You actually have 11 individuals signed up. I don't know if you'd like to take them all at the outset. How does the board feel about that? Sure. Okay. Okay, the first speaker will be Linda Beving. If you come forward. Just to remind everybody of the guidelines, um, five minutes for, the, uh, for your comments, please. And if you'd stick to that, I'd appreciate it, as would the board, I'm sure. Are you ready? Just let us know who you are so we can have it for yes, the sir. record, please. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Linda Beving. I live at 4785 Hilltop Drive, Northwest. I'm here to speak about the proposed development, Lakeside at Cedar Crest, that will be located at Cobb Parkway, Old Ackworth Ho Dallas Highway, and Old Grogan Road. I have a map for you. The area in orange shows the location of the proposed development and its proximity to Lake Alatoona. The two red dots on the map are the two sewage pumping stations. Both are located on the core property line. The developer has not provided any property within the development as a buffer for these sewage pumping stations. And when these pumps fail, they will dump raw sewage into Lake Atatuna, which is a major source of drinking water and a major recreational lake. At the yellow dot is the water intake at Blockhouse, and that's less than a mile from the sewage pumping stations. An article in the Cherokee Tribune on July the 18th, 2018, reported that a sewage pumping station on Blankets Creek has failed four times since January of this year. The failure in July released 21,000 gallons of raw sewage, a major disaster. It made its way all the way to Little River, part of Lake Alatuna. Do we really want to take the chance that raw sewage could be spilled directly into our lake less than a mile from the drinking water intake? In the Cobb County government publication, the CMOM, Capacity Management Operations and Maintenance Program, under section 4.5.3 entitled Lift Stations, in the last sentence of the first paragraph, it states, quote, the CCWS is currently in the midst of a long-term program to eliminate lift stations, primarily because of operation cost and reliability issues. And our open records request was an email from Tim Davidson to Jay Northrup dated July 25th, 2018. Quote, the nature of the two pumping stations shown on the attachments is a concern. 
Private pump stations are allowed by code. However, it does not appear either would satisfy the definition slash limitation of a private pump station. New public lift stations are discouraged by code and generally opposed by Cobb County Water System. Additionally, the City of Ackworth staff should be made aware that there is no capacity at Paulding County's pumpkin vine facility for this area of Cobb County, end quote. The same open records request also revealed that on February the 21st, 2018, the developer, Daryl Adams, sent an email to Christine Dobbs, City of Athworth. In this email, he stated, quote, it would be great if we could get this all approved and design this calendar year, end quote. This project is located outside the coverage area for the Cobb and Paulding IGA. A majority of the project is residential property that does not front Cobb Parkway, which is a requirement for the IGA. This same IGA specifically prohibits sewage pumping lift stations. On August the 24th, 2018, a group of neighbors met with Christine Dobbs and Brandon Douglas at the city of Ackworth. In this meeting, Mr. Douglas stated, quote, there's an agenda item prepared for formal application to amend the existing IGA. The city of Ackworth will not be a facilitator for that request. It will come from Cobb County, end quote. At the August 28, 2018 BOC meeting, Teresa Stendahl addressed this board about the IGA. In the discussion following her comments, I believe it was Rob Hosack who stated, quote, the city of Ackworth made a request to Commissioner Weatherford to introduce an agenda item to change the intergovernment agreement, end quote. Commissioner Weatherford leaves office December the 31st at the same time that the developer has his deadline for approval. Commissioner Weatherford represents District 1, where this proposed development will be located, where Lake Alatoona and the city of Ackworth are also located in District 1. Prior to being elected as a Cobb County Commissioner, he was an alderman in the city of Ackworth. It is our hope and our prayer that all of our commissioners will follow the Cobb County rules and guidelines already in place and that they will listen to the recommendations of their staff members. We request that you not amend the IGA, and thereby you protect our drinking water and you protect our Lake Alatoona. As Chris Purvis, the lead ranger for the Alatoona office, told me, quote, pound for pound, Lake Alatoona is the busiest and most used lake in the nation, end quote. Please protect our lake. Thank you. The next speaker is Pauline, and she'll help us with her last name. <laughs> I actually have some questions. Uh, good morning. My name is Pauline O'Dowd. I live at 5511 Autry Church Road in Ackworth. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking on the same topic as my colleague, but specifically on topics around the storm water runoff. Um, data driven, not my, not my personal opinion, all data driven, but I am concerned, been here in America for 20 years, living the American dream, um, truly. So um, the, just as an overview for, for the issues, we know the dam was never built for uh, Drinking water, it was for flood control and hydroelectric power generation. We know the Burris study in 1993 recommended strictly managed practices to reduce further pollution. Uh, in fact, it was closed to the public in 1993. We've mentioned the Blanket Creek pump failure four times since January. The Tribune Ledger, the same article that my colleague Linda just spoke to, talks about ongoing testing for fecal material and they'd be monitored for the next 12 months. We really have a chance today to make better, if not great decisions for future generations by not amending the IGA. I want to go ahead and just show you some quotes and some Cobb um, ordinances referring to storm water runoff. So Cobb Ordinance, Code of Ordinance, Section 50102, Purpose and Intent, maintain and enhance the public health, safety, and general welfare to control the adverse results of increased storm water runoff associated with both future and existing developed land within the county. 
Section 5105, scope of the article, provided for the appropriate storm water management that control or manage runoff in compliance with this article. We do see two retention ponds on the plat, but honestly, you know, I'm not a builder, a developer, a scientist, but is that really enough? I want to go on and quote the EPA.gov, January 2006, page four, critical land use components for protecting water quality for both low and high density developments. And they go on to talk about preserving open space. Preserving large continuous areas of absorbent open space, preserve critical ecological areas such as flatlands and floodplains and riparian corridors, minimize overall land disturbance and impervious surface associated with development. It goes on to say, preserving open space is critical to maintaining water quality at the regional level, large continuous areas of open space to reduce slow runoff, absorb sediments such as flood control and help maintain aquatic communities. It goes on, and I can quote all the research material from Shula 95, 2000, USDA 2001. The research indicates that lawns and other residential landscape features do not function in regard to water. Most communities focus not on the total land disturbed, but on the amount of impervious cover treated. Impervious services collect and accumulate pollutants deposited from the atmosphere, leak from vehicles or derive from other sources. During storms, pollutants are quickly washed off and rapidly delivered to the aquatic system. Studies have shown that at 10% imperviousness, a watershed will become impaired, the stream channel unstable, bank erosion and water quality and stream biodiversity will be decreased. Water quality suffers not only from the increase on impervious surfaces, but also from the associated activities, construction, increased travel to and from the development and the extension of the infrastructure. In April 2018, ehso.com causes and control of water pollution. Urbanization has been linked to the degrade, uh, degradation of urban waterways. Storm water runoff is the number one cause of water pollution in urban areas. In fact, we had a major storm in, in 2001, Peachtree Creek in Atlanta, quoted on water.usgs.gov. 7% of the water for the whole year was accumulated in that one day. And then just on another note, on a more personal note, even though I did aim for this to be data-driven, adjacent property owners have strong legal rights. DeKalb County versus Wapinski, um, the Supreme Court concluded that evidence of a 15 to 20 percent decline in the value of neighbours adjoining property was sufficient evidence upon which a trial court... Thank you, ma'am. That's your time. Oh, and I was just getting to the good bit, but thank you for your time. The next speaker is Mike Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time this morning. My name is Mike Russell, and I live at 4757 Old Ackworth Dallas Highway, which is in the cul-de-sac at the very end of the road, which is the part of the subject property that we're discussing today. I'm speaking in opposition to the said project using, um, uh, to the said, uh, to the proposed city of Ackworth annexation of Lake, Lakeside Cedar Crest with said project using Cobb Parkway, Old Ackworth Dallas Highway, Old Grogan Road, and Mason Road and in opposition to the, pro to the proposed modifications to the Intergovernmental Wastewater Treatment Agreement approved on March 11, 2008 by the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, which it seems like is now part of this annexation. I wish to address four major concerns that I have with this annexation and the, pros to, and the proposed development. First, previous speakers have spoken and will continue to speak on the soil concentration test results of the proposed annexation land which will result in excessive runoff of uh, pesticides, fertilizers, and many other chemicals directly into Lake Alatoona. I agree with and support their recommendations to the board um, to reduce the density, therefore lowering the runoff into the lake. Previous speakers have, secondly, previous speakers have spoken and will continue to speak on the sewage IGA 
where any proposed changes to this agreement will result in constitutional rights being taken away from citizens and the businesses of Cobb County. Specifically, this proposed development is looking at using one third of the future sewage capacity, capacity that was originally planned for the businesses along the Northwest Six Corridor. This impact will, uh, this will impact any future expansion, particularly like Wellstar, which is expanding today, and the church, both of which are rapidly growing. I agree with and support the recommendations to the board. Thirdly, the proposed annexation mixed use plan creates 140 units resulting in over 300 residential cars onto the smallest road, one of the smallest roads in Cobb County, and directly into one of the busiest intersections in Cobb County that currently cannot handle the current workload, transportation load, much less with the improvements that's going on today at that intersection. It just cannot handle that. Um, allowing another 200 cars to merge onto Old Awkward Dallas Road during rush hour will add approximately another 30 minutes just for me to get from my driveway onto Cobb Parkway. That's just absolutely unacceptable with the transportation in that area. As you know, the transportation <coughs> infrastructure is the single largest, project, uh, single largest problem in District 1, and the proposed annexation density is well over the current Cobb County zoning for that area. Fourthly, the sanctity, and this is from a, personal biz, from a personal perspective, the sanctity of the lake and the look of the lake with this, with this um, development is being destroyed. When you look at what Bartow County has done with Red Top Mountain, when you're on a boat and you're out there riding around and you see all these homes stacked on top of each other, it just takes away from the sanctity of the development. So therefore, we ask that you just really take a good hard look at what the lake means to you, what it means for you. The quality of life on Cobb County's beautiful Lake Alatoona will be permanently diminished by the current annexation zoning and the IGA modifications currently before you. I'm confident that if you were looking at the assets of Six Flags, of the Brave Stadium, of parks, you would do the right thing to protect those assets. You now have the ability to, to save the lake and preserve this treasured county assets. So I respectfully request the board do the following. Make no changes or amendments for this development to the Intergovernmental <coughs> Wastewater Treatment Group Agreement approved on March 11th, 2008 by the Cobb County Commissioners. And if you can, keep the property in Cobb County at the current land use plan with no annexation to the city of Ackworth. I feel confident that it's, if this proposed development came before this board for a rezoning, that you would not vote for it. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Teresa Stendhal. Good morning. My name is Teresa Stendhal. I live at 5850 Autry Church Road in Northwest Cobb, the Lake Alatoona Corridor. On August 28th, I came before you to speak on the Intergovernmental Wastewater Treatment Agreement that was approved in March of 2008 by the board. Just a very brief recap. That agreement calls for treatment capacity of a maximum 300,000 gallons per day, a designated sewer service area, and properties within the sewer service area must front Cobb Parkway and must flow by gravity to Pumpkin Vine Creek without pumping. In addition, Cobb County's $2 million economic development plan in the construction of a gravity sanitation sewer lines in the Northwest Cobb Commercial Assessment Area is underway. Expected completion is December of 2018. Let's talk about the sewer service area with limited capacity. The existing service area was not created by putting a map on a wall and throwing darts to see where they would land. The area was not to be a free-for-all, first-come, first-served service area. Cobb County did its due diligence and created a geographic area that would protect Lake Alatoona and the surrounding communities while allowing economic development at the same time. This is limited, planned, and environmentally friendly. Excluding the parcels fronting Cobb Parkway, especially on the east side, the land use designation is rural residential. The area should not be intense growth like other less environmentally sensitive areas of the county. Along the highway, there's the Cedar Crest Church, the Ackworth Wellstar Health Park, with expansion under construction now. On the west side, there's a McDonald's and a Mellow Mushroom and soon to be a Dunkin' Donuts. In November, this board will see a rezoning of 65 acres on the west side for age-restricted housing for 248 units. 
another small RSL is being considered fronting Cobb Parkway. Rural residential growth has had 16 new homes constructed on eight, eight acres on the east side. This is evidence that the county's economic development plan is working. Then along comes the city of Ackworth. The city wants Cobb County to deviate from the economic development strategy already in place. Ackworth wants Cobb County to change the IGA so that a developer, one developer, can steal from your constituents that you have been elected to represent. Not only will this developer change the character of the entire Lake Cor Alatoona corridor, he will potentially flush our constitutional rights away because of sewer capacity limitations that were taken away through annexation. What is Ackworth thinking? If Cobb County has such a good relationship with Ackworth, and I believe that they do, why is Ackworth willing to entertain such a proposal as Lakeside at Cedar Crest? And why does Ackworth not require the availability of wastewater infrastructure prior to annexation and rezoning? In a conversation with Christine Dobbs, Ackworth's Director of Community Development, on two different occasions, she said to me, we do not care if there is infrastructure available. We will annex and we will rezone. It is the developer's problem. It is not the city's problem. I have a problem with that. I understand that under House Bill 489, Cobb County had no legal basis to object to the annexation rezoning of this assemblage. However, how can Cobb County not do something, not only to protect this area, but to protect our constitutional rights as property owners? It's amazing that in 10 years, the county would go from protection of an area to possible impairment. In a meeting last week, I respectfully asked my commissioner to reconsider all options and not bring forth the agenda item to amend the IGA. I ask the same of each of you. Do not ignore your own constituents, the people you represent, and become as irresponsible as Ackworth seems to be in this instance. Final thoughts. The IGA was negotiated and agreed to by Cobb and Paulding County for 300,000 gallons per day of flow. Do not allow the city of Ackworth to thwart Cobb County's economic development plan in the Lake Alatoona area. Stand up for the constituents that you represent. Allow your plan, not the city's, to continue to thrive. Again, I ask, if the IGA is amended to include this additional property, is this an unconstitutional taking of property owners' rights that meet the criteria set forth in the IGA? And does this potentially limit the highest and best use for their property due to an unfair allocation of capacity? We respectfully ask that you just vote no when and if an amendment to this IGA should ever be brought before you. Thank you. The next speaker is Helen Gorham. Good morning, my name is Helen Gorham and I reside at 3528 West Hampton Drive. I am here this morning to request that the board not approve amending the 2008 IGA with Paulding County for sewer capacity. This request will come to you as a result of an annexation of property by the city of Ackworth. The annexation is a moot point since the city of Ackworth was permitted to annex the Army Corps of Engineers property and therefore allowed the city to be contiguous to numerous county properties. I delayed the core property annexation while in office for 12 years as I feared the city of Ackworth's development at any cost approach that is now coming to fruition. This request is only the beginning, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the city of Ackworth's de development plans around the lake. It appears that previous planning tools like the 2008 IGA and the Northwest Corridor Study of 2014 designed to allow for appropriate development protection of the lake, and sewer capacity for our tax-paying citizens are not highly respected by Ackworth and are meant to be ignored and amended. In 2008, an IGA with Paulding County was approved for 50 years for increasing capacities for both counties while using natural gravity flow and eliminating the need for lift stations and thus protecting the environment. The agreement would keep sewer tie-ins available and affordable for the taxpayer. Simply put, 
appropriate development under this agreement would take place a respectable distance from the lake. You are now being asked to amend the agreement so that a higher density development out of the original service area closer to the lake and requiring lift stations be allowed under this agreement. This is definitely not in keeping with the spirit and the intent of the original agreement. By amending this agreement, you will be allowing for an increase in non-point source pollutants, i.e. lawn fertilizers, dog waste, insecticides, and the transference of sewer capacity from the tax-paying citizens of Cobb County to a developer from Bartow County with a questionable track record here in Cobb. Hopefully, you will not approve the amendment to the IGA and send the developer to the Northwest Treatment Facility and allow those property owners within the service area the capacity their tax dollars paid for. I have emailed you all a PDF of the 2014 Northwest Corridor Study, which is comprehensive and a great tool. I have highlighted a few paragraphs that will give you the true intent and essence of the study, beginning with page one, the introduction. This study is, to, is intended to create a community-driven goal that will guide growth in an environmentally sensitive manner. I also request that you look at page 10 and also page 12, which I outlined for you in that document, which again, addresses concerns regarding the environmental sensitivity of Lake Alatoona. Instead of pushing for higher density to maximize the city's profits and setting a damaging precedent for development along the lake, the city of Ackworth should be grateful for the condition and quality of, uh, should be grateful and quality the county has for years maintained for the city's citizens and all those who enjoy and benefit from the lake. The county has worked diligently to protect a county drinking water resource and an economic engine for the city of Ackworth. My hope is that ultimately there will be no request for the amendment to the IGA and that the developer re will reduce density and tie into the Northwest plant, thus avoiding a potentially embarrassing scenario of county action to actually protect Lake Alatoona from the city of Ackworth. If reason does not prevail, then my request is for the board to vote no on the amendment. Thank you very much for this opportunity. The next speaker is Thomas Foster. Oh, Monica Delancey, I'm sorry. Hello, how you doing? My name is Monica Delancey. I'm here for the Riverside community. I want to first acknowledge that September is National Renters Month. Um, some interesting facts about renters. Um, renters pay more than 30 to 40 percent of their um, income on rent. Um, most households um, that are renters are headed by um, single income households as well as single parents and um, um, African-American women with children under the age of um, 18. So that's interesting facts about um, renters. Last month, we celebrated National Night Out Against Crime on August the 5th in the Riverside community. I have some pictures I want to share from the event. Um, this is just um, the first picture you see. Um, it's a uh, you have that? Oh, thank you. Um, it's just, just an overview um, of the field where the event was held at the Parkview Apartments on Riverside Parkway. Um, the purpose of National Night Out is to get together with um, community residents and also um, build relationships with the police department as well as the fire department. Um, this was our 10 year, 10th year observing National Night Out. Um, there's, in the past, we've hosted a town hall meeting, ice cream socials, um, pool meet and greets, a couple of festivals, and um, last year was a, a combined effort. We held the safety blitz, um, but this year was another festival. Thank you to a grant that I applied for from the Community Foundation of Atlanta. Um, here, I'm sorry I don't have the officer name, but that's Officer Friendly. I'm going to call him Officer Friendly, um, partaking in one of our VIP um, attractions, which was the game truck. Um, that was a highlight at the event. Um, and then um, here 
I'm sure you recognize um, these two individuals. We have Commissioner Cupid and um, Deputy Chef Van Hooser. I, I believe they're talking about the um, great things that's happening in the Six Flash Drive community, Riverside Parkway community. So thank you for attending the event. And then here we have um, our Chief Register um, uh, um, speaking to the community, um, along with myself and a couple of people that helped plan the event, uh, Ms. Elitra and her daughter, London. And um, I just want to say also thank you to um, um, Fire Chief um, uh, Mr. Mr. Kreider. I know I sent an email to request for the fire truck to come, and I guess between um, us planning the event, I never saw the email that they were coming, but I saw the fire truck pull up with those pink hats and red hats given out to all the children, so thank you for doing that. Again, thank you to um, Chief Register, um, Major um, Van Hooser, as well as um, Major Hamilton and Captain Kitchens from Precinct 2, because they helped in the planning process, and also um, to our Commissioner Cupid. And again, I just want to add some other great things that's happening in the community. Um, we have um, some students that have lived in the Six Flags Drive community um, since I've been here for 10 years that are now um, in, in college. And I don't know if you remember this, uh, uh, Mr. Boyce, but you came down and spoke to us in 2012 in our kids club. And um, that was, in, I guess, eight years ago. What's, six years ago, so now these students are in college. Um, and of course, Ms. Uh, Cooper, you've been with us the whole time as well. So the first student I'm gonna brag about is um, Mr. Tyler. He's at Benedict College in South Carolina. Um, he received a, a, a partial scholarship for being a part of the band. And so we just wanna congratulate him. Uh, and also, um, the next student I wanna recognize is Ms. Janelle Carter, she's at Benedict College as well. She received a partial scholarship for being in the band. And then um, the last student, I don't know if you know this young lady, but this young lady is my daughter, Brianna. She's at Bennett College in North Carolina. And so interesting facts about these students, um, they all attended Pembroke High School. Um, at some point or another, their parents either came to a community meeting or they came with us at the kids club. Um, and, and also, um, they stressed the reports of being involved, so I guess that's the way they became involved with the band, but it took a village to get them to college. So thank you, you guys have supported indirectly, directly for helping um, our children. But the last interest effect, which is on a sour note, they're in South Carolina and North Carolina. Please pray for them, because a hurricane is approaching. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Thomas Foster. Thank you. I'm Thomas Foster. I live at 4480 Old Grogan Road, which is adjacent to the proposed subdivision. Um, as a result of the million dollar Burris Institute study of pollution in Lake Alatoona from 1992 to 1998, practices associated with development in this area must be strictly managed to reduce further pollution of this large lake arm and to protect a drinking water source valued at $18 million in 1993 dollars. In particular, management efforts in this watershed arm should focus on practices that reduce stormwater runoff. Residential development involves lawns and their maintenance, runoff of fertilizers and pesticides from this development will be going directly into the lake. There would be no way to control runoff from clear-cutting this area for development. Silt fences would not be sufficient to prevent runoff into the lake during storm events. The cove closest to Highway 41 is already silted in from runoff from the land in the proposed development. Uh, I know this for a fact from traveling into this cove 
two weeks ago and found myself in three inches of water. How much worse will this cove get when this land is cleared, clear cut, and turned into a concrete jungle? Dust and noise pollution would be a major nuisance for neighbors for many years as a result of this development. This development is less than one mile from the Cobb Marietta Water Authority intakes, where they are permitted to pull 86 million gallons a day of drinking water for service to approximately 1 million people. Since most of this land will not pass a percolation test, they will have to install their own sewer system. This will require two pump stations on the development. Pump stations are subject to failure, especially during storm events. When these pump stations fail and flood, the sewage will flow directly into Lake Alatoona less than one mile from the drinking water intakes. The water treatment plant, the Wyckoff plant on Mars Hill Road has no capability to remove dissolved minerals and chemicals like prescription drugs present in wastewater. Dissolved organic material and urine will pass right through a water treatment plant. Only suspended material is filtered out. When dissolved organics, hydrocarbons, go through the chlorination process in the water plant, they become chlorinated hydrocarbons, better known as carcinogens. If you're not familiar with that term, that's cancer-causing compounds. The proposed pump stations are adjacent to core property and the 100-year FEMA flood zone, elevation 861. It would, be it would be a catastrophic event for the flow of raw sewage into Lake Alatoona. Pump stations require constant monitoring with instrumentation. Level transmitters constantly monitor the liquid level in the wet wells, and flow meters monitor flows to the wastewater plant. When this instrumentation is taken out by lightning strikes, flooding of the pump station can occur readily. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. Thank you, sir. That's your time. Like I said before, putting a high-density development this close to a drinking water reservoir is idiotic. The next speaker is Ben Williams. Good morning. Thank you so much for, for moving me up. I was prepared to sit here until the meeting um, was over. Um, <clears throat> I received my uh, new tax statement as a result of the board's action uh, to increase uh, taxes in order to help out for the $30 million <clears throat> deficit that was challenging the board. And in a kind of freaky way, uh, I was pleased. Because in my mind, it said that uh, we had come together, our elected officials, and those of us who really want to do what we can um, to cut that deal so that that deficit could be filled. Now, that may sound kind of freaky, uh, but sometimes I am that way. 
Now, <clears throat> and riding on a, on a high, riding on a high, I saw the number. It was a, an, an increase. Uh, but I felt as though uh, I had stepped up as a resident of this county, concerned about making sure that we move further towards solvency and also maintaining the quality of life. Now, the downer was when I read in the newspaper <clears throat> that once again, the Braves deal had raised its head and there was a dispute about the county owing them more money as a counter to the commissioner's stance that, in fact, they were obligated to us. And I commend chairman for taking a stance uh, that, in fact, uh, we would hold the line to get paid what we would do. <clears throat> I am also pleased that we were able to settle that in such a way that we would, in fact, get paid what we would do, plus some additional uh, funding for some other parts of the project that would be taken on by the Braves. But up through that, I also understand that there will be a decision made today by this board <clears throat> to pay some additional money having to do with management fees. Let me just share with you what keeps me up and down. Very quickly, I can remember a number of times the former uh, commissioner, chairman of the board, saying to us that there's a cap of public money to go into this deal. Now, unless I misunderstand it, uh, it seems as though that has been punctured so that seepage continues to come out. Um, that is a concern. That is a concern. Mr. Chairman, coming in, I can understand how oft times, you know, things that are readily, not readily apparent get in the inbox. But for those things to continue to flow, and they now become either new inbox issues or this board, this board is once again uh, making a commitment to expend more public funds beyond that which was obligated and, as I understand it, sealed. I've never heard during any of those deliberations the Braves step forward and publicly say uh, that statement was incorrect. Um, the seal on what the public would be committed to pay was incorrect, and we need to correct that. Not once did I hear that. So I would hope that as you deliberate today, that you would understand that it is uh, in our interest to hold the line and not one penny more. Not one penny more. Thank you so much. Um, we have the next two speakers, uh, Mr. Daniel and Mr. Norwood. Uh, ask your indulgence. Um, we're going to be addressing your issue right after the consent, and uh, Commissioner Cupid has asked us to bring that um, that issue forward to the top of the regular agenda item. So if you want to come and make a statement now, you can, or you can wait until we address the issue with Ms. Cupid, whatever whatever you're calling. I don't want to, I don't want to seem to be holding you back from making a comment. Uh, this is on the liquor, um, the liquor board decision. Okay, all right. So uh, the rules do not allow you to speak during the hearing, so I'm gonna to wanna to let you go ahead and make your comment now just so you can have your, your comments on the record, all right? The next speaker is Phil Daniel.
Thank you very much. Um, yes, what I'm speaking on is what will be coming up later uh, concerning the issuance of a permit for uh, alcohol for beer and wine, I believe it's referred to. I think the address is 1949 Powder Springs Road. It's at the corner of Milford Church Road and Powder Springs Road. <clears throat> there was a earlier approval of a Powder Springs Mart, sort of a convenience store at that location. Uh, then subsequently, they came back later and wanted to get an alcohol permit for that. And in the meantime, too, the property across the street from them, uh, which had been sitting vacant for a number of years, would, had been purchased by a uh, church. And now the church has already begun their construction work and uh, modifying the buildings to suit their needs. There hasn't been any ground broken at all on that corner where they wanted to put a convenience store. There's now a for sale sign on that corner. So I don't know where they're just trying to sell the property, trying to get a alcohol permit to be able to get more money for it or whatever on that. I am opposed to having the alcohol in that location and especially within the proximity to the church there right across the road. And we're not very far uh, up the road on Powder Springs Road from uh, shopping areas that have a Publix, shopping areas that have a Kroger, and those offer alcoholic beverage sales there. So it's available in those locations. I don't think we need it right there on Milford Church Road. So that's my opposition to this. And I came and spoke to the uh, licensing board that was uh, hearing that earlier, a five-member board, and when they voted, they voted five to zero against issuing that permit. So subsequently, it has been appealed to this board of commissioners. And I hope you will decide to also deny that permit. And thank you. The next speaker is Henry Norwood. Uh, good evening, morning. My name is Henry Norwood. I'm here about the alcohol, beer, and wine sales at the same address. Uh, what wasn't mentioned that within a mile and a half, there's seven stores that sell liquor or alcohol and cigarettes, and there's four gas stations within this mile and a half. So we feel like we don't need another store selling either one in the middle of a subdivision. This is residential where they're putting it at. The church is across the street. And then the houses in the one subdivision fall into the circle of allowing the, or not allowing the beer permits. They're not talking about the kids that walk back and forth to school, which is just right down the street. And they're also, at the last meeting, they, their attorney kept trying to convince us that the beer sales was only 10% of their sales. Well, I happen to know some people that own convenience stores, and they rely on 70 to 75% of beer as their income, not 10%. And so we're opposing this because we've got enough around there, and we don't believe we need any more stores that are selling beer and wine. And we hope that you all vote against it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, if if it would be um, permissible, Mr. Michael Roberts would like to have his name added to the last space on this block. Okay. Um, at this time, though, the next speaker is Neva Muhlenberg. Good morning. My name is Neva Muhlenberg, and I uh, did not intend on talking about the stormwater management and land issue uh, that these folks are talking about today, but I cannot help but to comment on it. All of you know the issue that I've gone through this past two years with my neighbor flooding my land um, and the codes not being enforced and me ultimately being banned 
from the county communication with community development because I complained about my property being flooded. So I'd like to put these pictures up so you can see what I started with. I sold, I sold the property on the left, a vacant lot, to my neighbors. And it was level with my land at that time. And, and if I stutter, I'm sorry. Um, I had been in chemotherapy for the last year, so I have fought this battle while dealing with cancer. And I'm glad to see the county supporting these children uh, fighting cancer. Uh, it's, a big, it's quite a big deal. So I sold this acre piece of property to some folks because I wasn't feeling very good. And then I ultimately ended up in cancer treatment. And I could not maintain that lot, so I sold it. And this is what my property looked like, my own personal property. Quite nice, uh, wooded lot. Uh, I moved down here to retire into peace and quiet uh, from the DC area. And across the way there is the property that I sold to the neighbors. And I'm gonna give you a whole bunch here. As a result, uh, my neighbors put up a 100 foot wall. You might wanna turn that uh, to the other, just rotate it one more time, my, one more time. My neighbors built that 100 foot wall between my property and their property without properly being permitted and constructed. And that, that black tube that you see down there is where they drain all of that 11 foot backfill onto my property without proper drainage in place. So my, my land is flooding. And so when we talk about stormwater management, their septic drain field is right behind where all that is flooding. And we can talk about their septic in a minute, but those footers right there are on top of temporary dirt. They built the dirt up and those footers are supposed to be 11 inches below the frost line and they're not. And that wall has either already failed, that's the picture of it, that wall has either already failed, the dirt you see coming out from there where one of the pieces of the concrete has uh, broken away or they just didn't build it all the way down to the ground. And the backfill that they put behind it is now on top of my property. And the building official is claiming that that silt fence, which has been up for two years after the certificate to occupy, and all of the arrows are showing where on the back of the property, they pitched their dirt or their drainage to my land with actual drain pipes uh, below ground. And then they, in the back of the land, they have, uh, like I said, they built up 11 feet. And in the back of the property, between my property and theirs, there's about four and a half to five feet of backfill. And the, the building official is saying that that silt fence, and I think some folks were talking about the silt fence earlier, is gonna hold back that land, I guess, into perpetuity. But right now, as it stands, um, the silt fence, has failed and is failing throughout the 100 feet because this is on a good day of what the silt fence looks like in the front. And then most of the silt fence has fallen down and nobody will make the, the my neighbors remove it. And they removed it from the front of the property where they can see it, but they didn't remove it from my side. There you go. That, I'm gonna show you a picture of where they have put, that picture on the right hand side is the back of their 100 foot wall and you can see the dirt from their side of the land, that five foot coming onto my property and that drainage is from their drain pipe. The whole back 25% of their one acre lot comes onto my land and it's flooding my backyard six inches of water. So if you're concerned about stormwater management doing their job, they're not going to. And they didn't with me. And actually as a result of me complaining to stormwater management to Frank, uh, Gibson, I have been, my emails have been banned from the county. And when I go up to talk to community development, they say I have to go talk to the county attorney. When I go talk to the county attorney, they tell me, well, you're in litigation with the neighbor, we can't talk to you. So that pipe my neighbor's buried, and you can see they've pitched it actually toward the footer, and then they're gonna take some of that dirt and cover up the footer that's supposed to be 11 inches underneath the frost line. And so if you're concerned about stormwater management, you should be, because it's a big deal. Part, and that's what the fence looked like. And that one area there, it looks like uh, it's two feet. That wall, it was 11 feet high and they cut it down two feet and now it's eight and a half feet. The county code says six. The building official is telling me that that middle piece of silt fence that is down. Thank you, ma'am, that's your time. Thank you. The two feet of dirt is, t is permanent and it's already eroded. I need those rags. The next speaker is Michael Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen um, of the board. Uh, my name is Michael Roberts. I live at 1902 Hampton Springs Court. That is the subdivision that just sits adjacent to the property that is seeking to put uh, said gas station, seeking beer and wine. Um, what I'm here is just to speak about um, quality of the area. Um, and we're, you know, I always ask my kids, what's your end game? And where are we taking this area? Uh, I've been at that residence uh, for 15 years. Um, the um, property that's just behind our subdivision has just been uh, developed for another subdivision. And I remember speaking with the, the owners of that property, which at the point in time owned everything from there. It used to be a lake at that property. It was a single home. Uh, but that family owned the property for Hampton Estates and the land where the church um, now currently sits, which sat vacant for, God, I remember when they knocked the trees down um, quite some time. I think it sat vacant for like eight years. Um, I, in living in, this, uh, in that neighborhood for 15 years now, um, I don't think what we need in that area is a gas station serving beer, wine, um, you just ask yourself, where where is this going as far as what what are we doing as far as uh, developing and, and, and furthering the, the area? Um, I don't think there's going to be a lack of gas stations. I think if you pull up in a five-mile radius, I don't think anyone's going to run out of gas. Uh, between the Publix, the Kroger, the Texaco, the Valero, on and on and so forth, so on. Um, um, I'm speaking uh, to Pastor Rutherford, who is here today of the uh, church that took uh, ownership of the vacant property. And I think the direction that um, he, as well as the surrounding neighbors, would like to see it go is in a positive direction. Um, we've had signatures from residents, may I, uh, I think it's one for everyone, um, that just we just don't don't feel that this is what the area needs. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for entrepreneurship and someone you know seeking out the American dream. Hey, I want to start a business. I previously owned the T-Mobile that sits at uh, Powder Springs right there in the Grove Park Shopping Plaza. That was my T-Mobile prior to me selling it back to corporate. But when you invest in an area, you want to uplift and bring positive to an you know to the area that you decide to stake root in or you know put your business in and i just um speaking for homeowners in hampton estates don't feel that this is uplifting or anything positive coming to the area especially with beer wine liquor so forth so on so i'm just speaking today as in opposition to uh that matter Thank you for your time. Okay, that's all the speakers. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, for the consent agenda, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, add two items to consent agenda. Uh, the first one, to authorize the advanced procurement of equipment in the, 2000, in the fiscal year 2019 adopted budget and authorize the fund balance appropriation fiscal year 2008 to facilitate the procurement. A second, a discussion, call the question. Passes five to zero. And the second one is I make a motion to authorize settlement of workers' compensation claim on behalf of Brenda Costley. We have a second discussion, call the question. Passes five to zero. Um, and then an admin note, we're gonna be moving item number 27 on the consent agenda onto regular. And then we have some other regular agenda items, but I'll talk about those after we do the consent. So that, I uh, make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as revised. Second. No, second. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll authorize the chairman to make all the mess, to sign all the necessary documents, execute the actions as approved. Okay, we have a second and discussion. Call the question. Passes five to zero, thank you. <clears throat> All right, for regular agenda, um, we're going to uh, 
I've been asked to uh, by the board to, uh, on behalf of Commissioner Cupid, to move item number 48, which was a uh, the issue involving the liquor license, to move that forward to discussion now. So after we do that, then we'll do the. So um, after we hear, do the hearing part, uh, then we're going to take a, a short recess. Okay, Commissioner Cupid. Attorney Hanson. We're under the understanding um, that the applicant for the license would like to continue this matter. They wanted to go back and address the community regarding some other considerations that they had, and they provided a letter last week, but it's been my understanding that um, there was not sufficient time to notify the um, community. In, in sake of um, cooperation, I would like to provide the applicant that opportunity, and I don't know if that's already been shared with you. It has, okay. Commissioner Cubitt, yes. Okay. And we're prepared to go forward if that's the board's pleasure, but I also have no objection to a continuance that has been requested. I've spoken to Adam Rosen, who's the attorney for the applicant, in regard to um, desiring to initiate a dialogue or continue a dialogue with some of the folks you've already heard from today who have con concerns about this application. So uh, we have no objection if that's the board's pleasure to continue this, but there has been a formal request made uh, for that purpose. Okay, thank you. So Chairman, if it's okay with you, I'd like to sure. move. I'd like to move that we continue the alcohol hearing into our next um, morning BOC meeting, which would be in the month of October. Like it. We have a second. Any discussion? Call a question. It passes five to zero. And okay. I just want to clarify for those that are here for that hearing and who did speak that it's my understanding that there will be an opportunity to present if you had already, um, I guess, communicated with the um, with the. With staff, well, there, on that matter. Maybe and you, we've you encountered this situation before. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There are two ways that they can address this hearing. Number one is by having filed a timely written objection with the business license division, okay. which several folks did do. That entitles them to be heard uh, as part of the evidence, and okay. uh, they'll be subject to cross examination during that hearing and so forth. In addition, as you're aware, whenever there's an application like this, there's signage posted on the, the site of the proposed uh, licensee. And anyone who sees that sign, which gives notice of the date and time and location of the hearing on this matter, can appear and request to be heard. Uh, we've had some people uh, speak, obviously, at the public comment section of this, but they also can speak, um, well, it's probably an either-or situation, at the end of the case in chief when we present that. Okay. and make whatever uh, statement they'd like to make at that time. So okay. there, there are two ways that they can uh, address the board in regard to this matter. So it's a little confusing, but okay. um, the way the code is structured now, that, that gives them an opportunity to speak as well. I appreciate you clarifying that. And um, that doesn't preclude those speakers from speaking during public comment, but it's certainly more apt to speak at that time if you have the opportunity so it can be heard at the same time. I'd also like to share that our hearings are at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning. So you will be here throughout the entire agenda, and then we'll have that meeting. So just take that into account as you're scheduling that time. Very good. Yep. With that, Chairman, if it's okay, I'd like to move. I already made my motion. Yeah, yes. Okay. Vote. And we've already voted. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just sort of an admin note. The reason we did it this way is because we had posted the signs. And so, therefore, we had to conduct the meet, ha, conduct the hearing, which Correct. is why we went, why we did what we did today. Okay, uh, we're going to take a, a ten minute recess, and I'm going to have where well, we did. Go back to sleep. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to have I'm going to ask Brad to go ahead and run the consent agenda on the board during the recess. so Everybody can see what we voted on. All right. So with that, we'll reconvene at ten forty. <clears throat>
Okay, we're back in session here, and just uh, for item number uh, 39 on today's regular, which is in the regular agenda, uh, we have uh, m put some additional language in there. That if you could put that up on the board once we once we come to the item, okay, on 39, yeah, yeah. just to hype, okay, and then um, we're going to be adding. Ben, did you bring back my? Right. Is Ben Williams in the audience? Yes, I'll read it for you. Okay, could you bring me back my document, please? <laughs> Good try and trying to trying to take it off the agenda. <laughs> We're going to be adding uh, number forty uh, fifty two, which is uh, to authorize a settlement uh, regarding a uh, issue between the uh, the Braves and the county. Okay, so that'll be the last one on the agenda today. So that I think the first uh, the first item is uh, first item on regular agenda belongs to DOT and Miss Miss uh, Miss Parrish. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, before I would start, I would like to mention that our first item that we're going to present to you this morning uh, there is that there's a typo in the agenda item. The dollar amount is correct. Um, however, on um, under the the water relocation lines, there is a there's a misprint in there. Um, the preliminary estimate says five thousand, and it should have been fifty five hundred. Um, and on the total part on that item, it is shown correctly. So it was just a, a typo, and we'll take care of that. So, um, so with that, I'll just go into the items. The first one is to request the Board of Commissioners to approve a contract with Accelera Construction LLC in an amount not to exceed one hundred and eight thousand six hundred dollars for Kent Road Sidewalk South. Let me get organized here, uh, Commissioner Burrell. Yes, glad to see this um, on the agenda today to get approved. And um, any estimate on time of when they will be installed? No, the, it, it, it will be this year. It'll probably take a, close to a month to get the contracts executed. Um, and then we've given the contractor 60 days, up to 60 days to have those installed. Okay. Motion to approve. Item 29. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Ch Chatfield Contracting, Inc. in an amount not to exceed $104,213.75 for drainage system repairs on St. George Terrace. Commissioner Cupid. Second. Second. Discussion? Call a question. Passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Baldwin Paving Company, Inc. in an amount not to exceed $1,882,268.34 for bridge replacement on Macedonia Road over Noses Creek. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Pass the five to zero. Thank you. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one to the contract with Lawson Enterprises, LLC, a no-cost time extension through October 31st, 2018 for schools on improvements on the Terrell Mill Road at Greenwood Trail. Ms. Schott. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. This is five to zero. Okay, thank you. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Accelera Construction LLC, a savings to the project in the amount of $18,641.39 for drainage system repairs on Piedmont Road. Commissioner Burrell. Uh, again, great to see a savings and great improvement to the to the drainage and the railroad tracks, a yes. smoother ride. Yes, ma'am. Motion you. to approve. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Okay, thank you, sir. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Accelera Construction LLC, savings to the project in the amount of fifty two thousand nine hundred and twenty nine dollars and twenty cents for intersection improvements on Brookbrook Brookview Road <coughs> at Terrell Mill Road and approve a contract time extension through September fifteenth, twenty eighteen. Commissioner Rock. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Thank you. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve a, con a change order number two final to the contract with Butch Thompson Enterprises, Inc., a savings to the project in the amount of $4,442.29 for drainage system repairs on Kilmore Drive. Mr. Weatherford. Motion to approve as presented. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes 5-0. Thank you. 
Um, the next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number two. Final to the contract with Suncoast Restoration and Waterproofing LLC, a savings to the project in the amount of $13,263.60 for rehabilitation of Concord Road Bridge. Mr. Cupid. Second. So second. Any discussion? Just oh. a note if the clerk sure. can put um, commissioner suggestion for funds to be used for additional warning signage. And a thank you to the guys who made the bar that stops everybody. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great project. Thank you. We just need to keep it from being hit. We do. Almost hit. <laughs> now I'll call the question. <laughs> Fastest five to zero. So our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve an intergovernmental agreement with Cobb County School District in an amount not to exceed $6,785.35 for improvements on Jim Owens Road, Lewis Elementary School, and on Ackworth U.S. Road at Jim Owens slash Mars Hill Church Roads. Commissioner Weatherford. A uh, motion to approve is presented. Second. In discussion? To all the question. Passes 5 to 0. Okay. Thank you. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve an intergovernmental agreement with Cobb County School District in an amount not to exceed $58,598 for improvements on New Macklin Road. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Okay. Our next item is to request the Board of Commissioners approve supplemental agreement number one to the Consultant Services Agreement with Southeastern Engineering, Inc. Project limits. Encompassed McEachern High School frontage on New Macklin Road and a portion of frontage on Gaydon Road. During preliminary project design, the Cobb County School District requested the addition of sidewalks within the project limits to improve connectivity with the, with, with the McEachern High School campus. To support these revisions, additional survey and engineering design is required, and the Cobb County School District has agreed to fund 100% of the design costs associated with these sidewalk improvements. We would request that the Board of Commissioners um, approve supplemental agreement number one to the consultant services agreement with Southeastern Engineering Inc. in an amount not to exceed $20,668 for engineering design of New Macklin Road. Now can I'm I finished. say something? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. No, I was reading the script here and like, <laughs> whoops. Anyway, Commissioner Cupid. Yes, and just want to thank you for emphasizing the funding for the design costs. So moved. We have a second. second. In discussion? Call the question. <laughs> Bass is five to zero. <laughs> and our last item this morning is to request the Board of Commissioners approve the recommended ranking of the three most qualified firms for engineering design of Cobb, Allen, Cobb Bob Callen Trunk Trail Phase 2, Segment B, um, Cobb County Project Number D11MO, formerly known as the Cumberland Community Improvement District Project Number CCID-1033, and authorize negotiations for final scope of services and fees beginning with the top ranked firm, Heath and Lombach Engineers. Ms. Sherratt, motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Great job. You're getting much better. Too. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the sports services uh, tab now, Mr. Cannon. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. I ask that the Board of Commissioners declare the three parcels of land at 53. 15 Church Street, 5311 Church Street, and 80, 859 Walker Drive surplus property, and to sell them to Sturgeon's Property Management LLC at a price of $52,415, and upon terms and conditions set forth in the attached agreement for purchase and sale through the brokerage firm of McWerther Realty Partners LLC. I ask that you authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Cupid. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to thank staff for getting me the appraisal for that, and I'm supportive of this item. Is that motion to approve? Second. 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 Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Thank you. The public safety tab, Mr. Heaton. Good morning, Chairman, Board of Commissioners, County Manager. Uh, today, coming to you to authorize the creation of three new positions in state court and two new positions in solicitor's office and other associated costs for the continuation of the school bus safety camera system program. On August 16th of 2000, 2012, the Board of Commissioners entered into agreement with the Cobb County Board of Education and America Traffic Solutions 
<clears throat> for the implementation of an automated uh, enforcement program for school bus warning device violations. That initial term of the agreement was five years and expired uh, November 8th of 2017. So last year on December 21st, the Board of Commissioners approved a contract amendment uh, for the initial one year renewal with options for annual renewals. And we are currently under in process of uh, doing a renewal contract uh, for a, the upcoming year. But what we have found is that the enforcement in conjunction with the legislative actions for processing these citations has placed a burden on resources available at the state court and solicitor's, solicitor's office. Therefore, additional positions are required. Those additional positions for state court would be a judicial administrative tech, a fiscal tech two, and a judicial admin tech four. And the solicitor's offices, that's an assistant solicitor and a, a legal administrative specialist. Um, other annual cost uh, or cost associated with this is uh, uh, one time call a court case management system integration computer cost to get this system put into place and some assorted uh, copying machines and other supplies. Um, the funding has been identified in the, uh, for the positions and the equipment uh, in the school bus reserve budget, the current stop arm uh, budget that we have today. This is a gap uh, budget until we get the new contract in place, at which time the new contract would provide the funding from the proceeds re uh, received from the stop arm violations. Um, <coughs> on the impact statement, the cost associated with these new positions and supplies is contingent upon the continuation of the agreement. If the agreement does fall uh, through or if it falls through years later, those positions could be in jeopardy uh, of not being funded. Uh, so with that, uh, asking the Board of Commissioners to authorize the creation of three new positions in state court and two new positions at the solicitor's office and other associated costs for the continuation of the stop arm or the school bus safety camera system program, authorize the budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. Uh, Director Eaton, just to be clear, if we do not get the contract, then these are not funded through that. Therefore, that'd be the responsibility of the solicitor in the state court to fund them if they want to continue with them. Yes, sir. And in years in the future, if it goes away, it again will not be funded from this or from the general fund unless requested by these two departments through their own budgetary process. At your discretion, sir. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Motion to approve is presented. Okay. We have, okay. Any other discussion? Yeah. Sure. I just want to, um, since Barry's in the audience, I did, it's not a little bit unrelated, but I just want to thank you for allowing Latonia to work with um, myself and Kim and, and everyone else over at the stadium. It's been a great help in kind of keeping things safe. So thank you. Well, you're certainly welcome, uh, uh, Commissioner. She's, she's here. Oh, there. <laughs> yeah, there she is. <laughs> Sitting as she does, and, and uh, pending your your approval of this, she will be the one who will be directly doing this and the Brave Stadium so that uh, I've got a very experienced and uh, competent person. To handle. Absolutely. She's been a tremendous help. Thanks. Commissioner Burwell. Yeah. Um, we did have some discussion about this at Agenda Prep yesterday, and I yes. just want to make sure that with the revision of the contract or renewal of the contract, um, the vendor will get their percentage, the, the funding that is split between us and the vendor and the schools will, these positions will be covered first and then excess will come to to be split three ways. That is, that is what the, the contract that we are working on currently, yes okay. ma'am, that's our, our so intent. So this amount, although the numbers don't match up for the total amount of mm -hmm. the positions, this is just the next four months to the end of the year till the contract can be Yes, ma'am, that is correct. This is a, a, a gap uh, fix, if you will. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Cupid, did you have some comments? Yes. You did? Okay. Uh, before we vote on it, I just want to say that, you know, this is a great example of a, a good that we should be doing, but it, does, but it comes with a cost. And uh, I just hope the public realizes that it, I'm just shocked, quite frankly, that we have this many people that uh, would run the run run around a school bus that we have the amount of money we can do to fund this i just yeah. never fails to surprise me given how know how much i know the people in Cobb and how you know how great they are so um i would hope that 
our next challenge would be that we, when we start to enforce this, you know, and the message gets out that if you do this in Cobb County, you are going to be held accountable, that the numbers will go down. And so our next big challenge would be what happens when you the numbers get so low that it doesn't bring in the revenue to fund these positions. Sure. But I would welcome that kind of challenge. Absolutely. Uh, one more comment. Sure. And just to be clear, if you would clarify the fact that it, the way we do this versus maybe red light cameras is that we do have a certified also review all of these before they're gone on to the third party vendor. That is correct. The vendor does send us the videos and the photographs, and we do have a police officer that reviews each one of those citations before it's given to the courts. Uh, and so, yes, it's verified through a police officer uh, before it's. And I think that's just another example of how we do things different and better here in Cobb, and as opposed to just looking at a third party vendor that makes a decision whether it was actually a citation issuable offense or not. Yes, sir. Thank you, Trick. Yes, sir. Okay. With that, I'll call the question. Pass this five. Thank minutes. you. Okay. Um. Morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. County Manager. We have one item uh, to approve the purchase of hardware engineering and installation services from Motorola Solutions, Inc., associated with adding fixed network communications equipment at two public safety tower sites to the Cobb County 800 megahertz radio system and associated project costs from the 2016 SPLOS Program Funds Public Safety New Towers Program X1011. A little background, the first of the three 2016 SPLOS sites located at 4900 Camp Highlands Road was completed in April 2018. In lieu of building two additional new sites inside Cobb County, we are partnering with um, Bartow and Douglas County. Um, to, and these sites will increase coverage in the northwest and southwest parts of Cobb County. I would like to note that by partnering with our neighboring counties to co-locate our equipment, we've been able to save approximately $481,000 from the original projected cost of these projects. So I would ask that the Board of Commissioners authorize the purchase of hardware, engineering, and installation services associated with adding the fixed network communications equipment to the 800 megahertz radio system in the amount of $3,481,872 from Motorola Solutions, Inc., using 2016 SPLOS program funds, authorize the purchase of additional associated project costs in an amount not to exceed 37000 using the same funds, authorize the budget transfers, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Mr. Weatherford. Motion to approve is presented. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. Thank you. Passes. Thanks, Ms. Davidson. Uh, the next one is lead county manager. Oh, Chairman, okay. Commissioners, Mr. County Managers, it's my pleasure to bring this item before you. I ask that uh, you authorize the FY1920 allocation of funds to nonprofit organizations serving residents right here in Cobb County. By way of background, for many years, Cobb County has partnered with the Cobb Collaborative to develop the grant application procedures and manage the review process, which is approved by the Collaborative's Board of Directors. On December 12th, 2017, the BOC adopted four priorities in which the grantees were to comply for funding consideration. These priorities include homelessness, family stability, including poverty, ex-offender reentry slash workforce development, and health and wellness. The application process was advertised and informational workshops held to thoroughly review the application submission process and the key new requirements set forth by the Board of Commissioners. Funding recommendations have been reviewed by the Collaborative's Board of Directors and presented to the Board of Commissioners as well as the County Manager. For FY 1920 funding, the Collaborative received 27 applications totaling $1.8 million in requests. Of those 27 applications, five were deemed ineligible, nine were new grantees, and 13 were current, current grantees with requests totaling 1.5 million. After a very competitive evaluation process, the Collaborative is recommending funding of $850,000 for 15 nonprofit organizations plus the Collaborative. 27% of the funding would focus on homelessness, 39% on family stability and poverty, 32% of the funding on health and wellness, and 2% on ex-offender reentry workforce development. 
These specific nonprofit grant awards are included in your documents attachment A. Funding is available in the county's FY 2019 general fund budget, which was adopted by the board July 25th, 2018. Therefore, I ask that the Board of Commissioners authorize the FY 2019-2020 allocation of funds in the approved amount of $850,000 to local nonprofit organizations, authorize the corresponding FY 19-20 budget transactions, and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents. Thank you. So here's like to do this. I'd like to go ahead and make the motion uh, to, to approve and then get a second and then have a discussion. All right. Since I heard some uh, some some points of gender preference, there might be a sea change on this. So I thought that this would be an apt time to uh, to bring this out to for full discussion. And I think Commissioner Weather brought a great point here. Even though we approved a budget line of eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, we did not approve the programs. So I didn't include these programs in the budget. So we still have to approve these programs to match the eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, if we so choose. Yes, sir. Okay. So, does so everybody understand what I'm trying to do here? With that, I make a motion to approve the agenda item as read. Second. Okay. So, um, do you have the charts that were at the back? The one that lists all the funding recommendations, and then the one that talks about the partnership collaborations. Do you have those? We can put up on the screen. Is that the one you're talking about, Chairman? Okay, could, yeah, could, you, could you make that a little bigger? There you go, all right. I'd just like to take a look at this. <laughs> there you go. Um, these are the, these are the uh, recommendations from the collaborative for funding under, uh, that they submitted to the county. Why don't you take a look at those for a second. And then the next sli slide is gonna be these same programs and what I asked uh, the collaborator to do was provide me a chart for these programs that had a formal or informal partnership with some program here in the county. Okay. Um, the, the highlighted ones are ones that didn't have any partnership reflected on this chart. And there was an administrative error yesterday that was corrected today. The Atlanta Community Food Bank does provide food for Meals on Wheels for the Senior Services Program here in Cobb County. The other two, still the other two you know, based on this chart here, um, from was provided to me by a collaborative. They, there are no partnerships with the county, formal or otherwise. Okay, so um, given that I sensed that there might be a sea change in how we support this, what I, and it was a last minute, uh, it's not a last minute, that's the wrong choice of words. What I'd like to do is just have, uh, I've asked some people from, from this chart just to come up here and give us a very brief comment on the impact of what it would have on their programs if, uh, if we did not approve this funding, okay? So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Carter, if she'd come up here and and I do mean, you know, a brief, some brief comments, but. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, commissioners, um, wanted to begin by saying, uh, even though the 850000 had been allocated, the impact of not receiving that money um, for the FY1920 cycle, we not only lose the $850,000, but we lose the additional approximately $3.1 million these organizations leverage or use to match for additional funding, whether that be through federal funds or potential donors of private funding sources. Um, the impact um, you've heard through the process of the FY18, when the funding was removed from the budget, they came out in force and showed what that impact would mean to the community. We pride ourselves on knowing that we take part in the economic development within this community, um, just as any of the other businesses within this community in returning citizens to a stable environment on their feet to be able to be productive citizens within Cobb County. Without this funding, the community will feel the repercussions of that eventually. 
Um, there are several of the organizations here today um, that are on this list that can tell you better than I the impact that it would mean to the people that they serve. The $850,000 represents black and white dollars and cents and decimals on a sheet, but they represent the true faces of the people that that money serves. With that, um, you mentioned the, the chart that you see before you. This is new and we were asked to include this as the um, application was completely redesigned based on the new priorities. This question was never meant to be a requirement for funding, truly a data-driven question so that we can see how these nonprofits are working within the community and the opportunity to show where some improvements might be needed. So um, just with the two organizations that you have highlighted, it doesn't mean that they don't necessarily work or formally partner. They may get referrals from the county in some form or fashion. But again, as I mentioned, this was never an opportunity to be um, a point-driven question on the application, nor was it meant to mean that it was a requirement in order to put, um, obtain funding through this source. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, and I was talking to uh, uh, Ms. Jerry, Mrs. Jerry Barr yesterday, and she said something that had caught my eye. So I'd like her to come up for a second. And uh, if you just sort of tell the board here what you told me if, if – um, if we don't approve the funding, what basically will happen to your organization, which has been around for almost as long as you have? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not that old. <laughs> it, was, it was founded in 1960. Trust me, I'm not that old. There you are. Chairman, thank you, and commissioners, thank you. Uh, I, I'm not remembering precisely what I said to you, but I did say that this could be the death knoll for uh, a number of nonprofits, large and small, because you think our, our larger nonprofits can withstand anything, and we cannot. Let me just tell you about two programs that we have. We have homeless prevention and homelessness. We help hundreds of families prevent them from homelessness, stay in their apartments, pay their rent, pay taxes, buy groceries, and stabilize their family so their kids can stay in school. We prevent homelessness for hundreds of families so that they indeed can stabilize. Over 80% of our families homeless families then become stable, rent apartments, pay rent, pay taxes, buy groceries in this community, and their kids are stable in schools. This is a huge service to the county, particularly if you think about the eviction notices that I know that you all have to deal with and what that does to the court system. So you think about those families that we're really able to help. And to kind of piggyback on what Karen said, uh, we do receive quite a bit of uh, dollars from HUD, and we do it because we have match dollars. Match dollars are the dollars you uh, award to us, as well as, as other uh, funding that we get from the community. It's very important to have those dollars, to bring those other dollars into the community to serve these families that need it so badly. So thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to say a couple of words. You're welcome, Ms. Paul. And then my last request is, um, I see a white-haired gentleman in the back. Uh, who I'll be asking to come up here for divine inspiration, uh, Reverend Ike Reichert. Since I've already dug my hole with Mrs. Barr, I won't dig mine with you by saying how old you are. <laughs> that is greatly appreciated, sir. <laughs> really. I'm so excited about turning 50. So uh, th thank you all for what you do for us here in the county. Y'all are, are amazing the way you help us. To give you a quick idea of uh, how this would impact MUS, um, we had two main areas. Uh, we were allocated uh, $53,000 basically there. And 67% of that, $35,512, helps to fund the Elizabeth Inn Shelter. Right now, we turn away between two and 300 people a month. And of the two to 300 uh, people we turn away each month, 74% are women and children. Uh, so this includes some hotel motel vouchers, some things like that, that when we can't find another place to be able to, to slot people. And, and we're very thankful we have a coordinated uh, system uh, here in Cobb when it comes to entry uh, into the homeless shelters that we have and the beds that are available. We're, we're thankful for all of that. Uh, last year, uh, we found out at MUST, and we were so delighted, that 84% of the people that came
came to our homeless shelter went on to a more stable environment. And an emergency walk-up shelter, the national average is about 40%. So these funds help us to be able to get people into a much better place. And whether it's a transportation voucher, that's a lot of uh, what this does. But this is a part that, to me, is the real core of who we are at MUST. Uh, 33% of the fund, $17,490, will go to help us in our South Cobb location in employment services. Uh, this past year, uh, through MUST, we helped 618 people get jobs. Uh, 330 of those people were out of the homeless shelter. So you're talking someone that had no place to live, had no job, and now they've gotten to a more stable environment. And if you extrapolate the 618 jobs, it represented $11 million back into our community. And if you look at just strictly the South Cobb location, uh, that was $1.3 million that was created there uh, through the employment services at that area. So these are the things that help us to continue to do uh, what we've been doing. You've been great partners to us for years, and uh, we love our continuum of care and all the other organizations we work with, and so I would really hope that this uh, would be approved. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I know uh, I just want to, to be recognized, those other uh, ladies and gentlemen who came here from some of the programs, you just come up here and on the podium to tell us who you are and what, what uh, organization you represent. I want to make sure you get on camera here and get on the record. Good morning. I'm Natalie Rutledge. I'm the Executive Director for Communities and Schools, and we appreciate you hearing this on, for us today, and your support helps the prevention and intervention of uh, dropouts in Cobb County and family perseverance. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Missy. Good morning. My name is Missy Owen, and I'm the CEO of the Davis Direction Foundation. We fight addiction and fuel recovery. We currently have over 3,500 visits to the zone, which is not even two years old until the end of this month. And for every person we can keep in recovery on a daily basis, we put $18 back into the local economy by not having recidivism as part of what we do. And with Cobb County being the number one um, county in the state with drug overdose what we do is vital to this community thank you thank you good morning i'm laura keith with marietta yale's youth empowerment through learning leading and serving and i'm here representing the franklin gateway community and thank you for your support over the years you provide the support that allows us to educate our youth and then have them reinvest in their community as well as their families. So it's a big empowerment network that keeps our communities getting stronger, safer, and better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ophelia Nunez, and I'm here representing the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta. I um, wanted to say thank you for your continued support over the years. Um, you, with your support, we've been able to provide um, services to more than 1,400 children in all four uh, districts in Cobb County. We currently have three clubs in Cobb um, that serve over 200 children each and every day in our after-school programs, providing youth enrichment programs programs and programs that will prepare them for great futures. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Christina Cummings. I am the executive director of Kids to Leaders, and we are working to break the cycle of incarceration by providing stability, opportunity, and Christian community for children of inmates. And um, we have been in Cobb County for about 20 years. This would be new support for us and specifically would help us expand our family support programs to increase stability in the homes of children and inmates, children of inmates in Cobb County. So thank you for your consideration and everything that you do here. Thank you. And lastly, I'm Tara Riddle. I'm the managing attorney of Cobb Legal Aid. We're the only nonprofit in Cobb County that provides free civil legal 
uh, work for indigent people and, and, and citizens of Cobb County. We um, thank you for your support over the years, and we specifically use Cobb Collaborative money to prevent homelessness. We're the only nonprofit that represents folks in eviction court every single week. We get about 4,000 calls a year um, in Cobb County, and we also provide a lot of free educational seminars for citizens at the public libraries. We do an eviction clinic once a week, staffed by attorneys to help folks prevent homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. And now I'm going to open the uh, board uh, for discussion. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, you know, we've seen at the beginning of the program how uh, we recognize our libraries and how we fund our parks and how we fund many other quality of life activities for our citizens of Cobb County. And I think it would be you know, hypocritical of us not to fund nonprofits that provide a quality and level of service to those less fortunate than us to help them achieve the same quality of life that others like ourselves enjoy. We've done it for many, many years. And the, the difference, I think, uh, in to the chairman's um, leadership is that we now know what particular areas of county functions that these nonprofits provide services to, which in turn lessens the burden and the cost to the county uh, that we do not have to provide either in public safety other public services that they provide for us and they in fact leverage it for that reason and they essentially as i said reduce the burden improve the quality of life to those less fortunate and i fully support this sir so, okay. i think it's due to the organizations that are here that I speak and share my perspective today because I'm probably the one that has caused some sense of disruption and how you may have depended on this being allocated. I've been on this board for about six years and even prior to being here, there has been continual frustration amongst different nonprofits that never surface on this list. A lot of those nonprofits that continue to have those frustrations are within District 4. There has been um, an evaluation of our process within the county to determine how to um, look at the disbursement of these funds. We've had a lot of challenges, I think, in determining how to implement that audit. Year after year, I've continued to, um, with some angst, um, support this work because I know that the work that these organizations do are good work. And, what you've shared today, and um, it certainly touches my heart, all the work that you do. I've called on many of you who are speaking before us today, asking for your support when we've had different matters going on in the district. My concern is not um, with respect to the value and the service of your group. It is solely with respect to equity. I'm very concerned about this process and equity. Um, as for all the good work that's done by the members of the organizations in this room, there are a lot of other people and or other organizations doing good work. And they continue not to be supported and to, they're not able to get the capacity that you are able to, that I don't say you, but there are many organizations that continue to appear not only here on this list every year, but also on our federal grant list as many of these organizations also get other monies from the county. And those organizations' capacity continues to grow while other organizations continue to lack the ability to gain capacity. And then they're told why you're not on this list because you don't have capacity. And it's just... Um, I think while we continue to strengthen these groups, I just see it just weakening the ability for others to gain the same type of support, even though they're out there every day, grandmothers taking money out of their pocket to serve some of the same interests that we have in this room. It's just very difficult. Um, that is not even what drove me here today, even though I've cured that in the back of my mind. Um, is when yesterday at the executive session, we pulled out this policy list and there were some org other organizations that are on here, are there some organizations, three of them, which didn't fall in the criteria. Then we began to discuss, well, how did they get on the list? We said they're supposed to meet the criteria. And then I looked at food security for America and certainly they're not on the list, but food security is significant. 
How do you tell someone that helps keep people fed that you don't have a value to this county? Because hungry people do desperate things in that hunger. And so we're they're evaluating, well, do you serve the county? The reality is there are many people and many organizations that serve the county every day that will never appear on this list. They'll never appear on it because they may not fit squarely in one of our um, groups that are here, and they'll never fit on this list because they don't rise to the occasion of passing through the assessment process here. And it frustrates me. It frustrates me because if, if there's anything that I try to be about on this board, it's about equity. As much as I look to what we do is the how we do it. And I'm just frustrated with the how, Chairman. I just, it's not about the what. The what is excellent. But just over the six years, I have barely seen changes to this that show an equitable um, consideration of all the people that are providing good work in this county. And I think seeing this list before me and, and going through the conversation yesterday just put it, it just, it, it just filled me with such great discomfort that it's, it's almost impossible for me to go through with this today knowing the good work that goes on in the county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First off, I want to start by saying that I think that what each one of the organizations does is a service to the community. Um, many of you have heard my comments in the past about my concerns about using taxpayer dollars to fund nonprofits. But um, more importantly, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, I was not able to be here at the um, meeting yesterday. This is the first time I've seen this chart, which I think, although, as um, Ms. Carter said, it was not something that was originally used, I think it's important because last year, this board made a decision of the criteria that would, the board would use to determine whether or not um, a nonprofit um, or how a nonprofit served the community. And so with not having been here yesterday, and this is the first time I've seen this, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a substitute motion that this be tabled. Okay, we have a motion to table it. We have a second. Second. We have a second. Uh, any discussion about this? I'm just sure. Yes. Can you clarify why you like this table? Um, I would like to table till the next meeting because my understanding is that the nonprofits need to have an answer by the end of the month. So my motion would be to table it until the um, night meeting. So two weeks. In order to provide them more time to respond. Yes, provide them more time to respond and give me some opportunity to better understand exactly what this chart is showing and how it um, corresponds to what the board decided last year. Yes. Yeah, and, and the reason I asked for this chart is, is that um, I've been saying on many occasions that the reason we, that, um, we went through the um, process of identifying the four categories was there was this narrative out there that we were simply giving money to people out there. So I heard that. And uh, working through our uh, special assistant, uh, we came up with these categories and we, we voted on these last fall and approved them. So that was the first step. And then um, I didn't see any kind of a, um, a graphic that would show that point about, okay, once we've got the categories identified, how do we in fact, you know, how do they in fact uh, fulfill my commitment and statement that these nonprofits are performing a service for the county that we should be doing, uh, but they do it better and cheaper. And I think that as I visited many of these programs here, we already have some things that, you know, if we in fact don't fund them, uh, it will have an impact on public safety because we already have partnerships in public safety in many of these things. And it also gets to the bigger issue for me of what is the nature of this county? And um, while I understand that it's always very difficult to, uh, to fund anything using taxpayers' money, is this for the greater good of the county? And the answer, in my opinion, is yes, because um, a lot of these programs here, like it was so eloquently stated here, if we didn't support them with these programs, we would end up supporting them by county programs, either uh, in, our, uh, in our jails or at public health. So uh, I agree with Commissioner Rod here. I think we need some more time here just to evaluate this chart, perhaps, for the commissioners also to get more time to talk to these, uh, to talk to these uh, agencies and be more comfortable about what it is we're doing with the taxpayers' money. Commissioner Burrow. Um, and I agree, but I just want to clarify that um, I know these organizations are wonderful organizations and they do serve 
a great part of our community and do things that possibly we could, can't do as a county government. Um, and I know that it, the money has been set aside in the budget that passed, um, but my concern is, is taxpayer money involuntarily. Um, a lot of us contribute to most these and then some others that aren't on this list uh, on an individual basis through our church or organizations that we um, serve on boards and things like that. So I, I'm, I am more in favor of a voluntary program that we had discussed in the past to fund um, these nonprofits. Okay, any other comments? So yes, that, I'll yes. Mr. Cupid. And I'll respond to that and um, share that I'm also in support of a voluntary process, Commissioner Brohl, and I'd like to talk to you more about that because I still think it could be done. I know in my gas bill, we have the ability to donate. And, um, you know, I, I just think that the last thing we want to do is not show that there's value to the work that's being done. And um, if there's any other alternative we could do to, to do that, I, I'd be willing to do it. But I also agree that we constrain our we constrain our taxpayers to saying that these are the ones that should be elevated. And I, I don't know. I'm just having a difficult time with that. And I understand your concern. It's a valid one. So with that, we have a motion on the table to on, on the uh, table to table it. Yes. So with that, I'll call the question, and it passes four to one. Okay. Thank you. All right, and now we'll be going to uh, edition of the new agenda item to discuss the uh, authorization of a settlement of demands and counter demands relative to SunTrust Park with the Atlanta National Base League Baseball Club, uh, the Braves Stadium Company, and the Braves Construction Company, uh, and of course the county. So with that, again, for purposes of discussion, what I'd like to do is make a motion to um, We go ahead and read a motion here and then ask for a second so we can have discussion on this. Um, I recommend, I, I move that the Board of Commissioners authorize a mutual settlement of demands and countermands relative to SunTrust Park, the Atlanta National League Baseball Club, LLC, um, Bread Company, uh, LLC, Braves Stadium Company, LLC, and Braves Construction Company, LLC, collectively the Braves Parties, in accordance with the terms outlined in the agenda item and as, out, as discussed in executive session on September 10, 2018, and further authorize the chairman to execute settlement documents in a form approved by the county attorney. Give a second. All right, with that. Chair, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we actually did not do a motion to add this to today's agenda, so before we can vote oh, okay. on that, we need to do that motion. Okay, so can we, can we just roll the tape back? Will. Just delete that. So I'm, I make a motion that we approve that we add to the agenda, the regular agenda, um, the settlement of demands and counter demands between the Braves parties and the county. Second. Any discussion? Call the question. Okay, it's passed by the zero. Now we ready to move the tape forward, and uh, my motion to uh, and I'll, to make sure we do this legally. All right, because I know this is going to be a very spirited conversation. Uh, make a motion the Board of Commissioners authorize the mutual settlements of demands and countermands relative to SunTrust Park, the Atlanta National League Baseball Club, LLC, uh, the BRED Company, LLC, Braves Stadium Company, LLC, and the Braves Construction Company, LLC, collectively the Braves Parties, in accordance with the terms outlined in this agenda item and as discussed in executive session on September 10, 2018, and further authorize the Chairman to execute settlement documents in a form approved by the County Attorney. Now we have a second. All right, now we can legally, legally talk about this. So, Mr. Chairman, Deborah? can I just make a quick? Sure. Um, I just want I mean, yes, I was not here yesterday, but I um, talked to the chairman about this, and I spent uh, time this morning talking with uh, Deborah Dance okay. to right. get up to speed on it. Okay, so that I'll let you. Um, I, th I think what we should do here is that we had, a, we had a good discussion yesterday. I think we understand what the nature of the discussion is. So I think what I'll do is I'll start the discussion here, uh, Ms. Dance, and then 
will draw you into the conversation as questions emerge. You want to hear from her first? Okay, all right. Sure. Okay. <laughs> they want to hear from you. Thank you. Well, no uh, singing. Say it again. No singing. There, there is no danger of that. Uh, last May, this board authorized and directed uh, legal to go and pursue um, claims with the Atlanta Braves parties to recover or to obtain payment for a $1.4 million SDF fee owed to the water system. Um, we did pursue that, and in May of 2018, through outside counsel, we conveyed a demand upon the Braves for the payment of that fee. In response, they came back and uh, responded to us on May 30th and took the position that they did not owe the SDF, but that we owed them an additional $4.6 million. Um, subsequent to that time, as everyone knows, there have been um, efforts to set forward a, a mediation session. Um, in the intervening time, we have had discussions with Braves that have been fruitful, and therefore we've brought forward this recommendation for settlement. Um, under the terms of the settlement, the Braves have agreed to pay the full $1.486 million to the water system for satisfaction of the SDF fee. Under the proposed settlement, the county would agree to reimburse the Braves for $500,000 for payment of the county's project management costs that were advanced through the project bond funds. Under the proposed settlement, the Braves would pay us a $380,000 that's contractually obligated under what we previously, uh, the board previously approved as the bridge signage and maintenance agreement in February of 2017. Um, the parties would agree that the $380,000 owed by the Braves to the county could be an offset against the $500,000 resulting in a net due from the county to the Braves of $120,000. And then the county would continue to honor a commitment made by this board uh, in June of 2017 to satisfy the full $14 million of the transportation and infrastructure agreement um, that results in two payments, one due in October of, of this year and one due in October of next year, each for about $166,000. So the, this results in a settlement that results in a net payment to Cobb of $1.36 million um, and resolves all claims. The Braves have agreed to erase or eradicate all other claims that were set forward in their counter demand. Um, so this would resolve all issues between the parties. Open the board for discussion. Who would like to go first? Okay, Commissioner Burrell. Um, thank you, Deborah and, and Steve and Bill for the, the hard work that went into this. Um, what concerns me is we're still here from an agreement that was approved five years ago with costs that we didn't know about on the HERI deal um, consulting uh, bring, coming before us. I think what um, has been outlined here is a good settlement, if you will, um, but I'd still like to see where the $1.5 million in the HERI contract, I think that should be entered into the record and and the uh, payments that were made that we are now um, reimbursing for. I think that needs to be part of the record to show that. And taking this a step further, even though it's not in the agenda item or discussion, I think moving forward so that we aren't surprised by anything that we agreed to five years ago keeps coming back to haunt us maybe um i think the county manager and the county attorney whoever that is at any given time should be the um representatives for the braves and anything anything that is negotiated or um offered or what have you has to come back to this board for approval. 
there, nobody can make any verbal commitments one way or the other without this board knowing about it and voting on it. And that's all I have to say. Okay. And you may have a good point. Do we have that document? We, we have here the agreement for consulting services right. that um, Brad's putting up. Um, this is the agreement was entered into by this board in September of 2014 between Cobb County and Heary. So it was a private contract between Cobb and Heary. It was not a contract between Cobb and Heary and the Braves parties. So this was the county's obligation. Under the development agreement, $300,000 of project bond funds were eligible to be spent on this consultant agreement. The rest of it was the county's obligation. So. This is page one of that agreement, and if Brad, if you'll go to page four, uh, this is a compensation paragraph in that, um, I'm probably about 10 lines down on the left, you see the $1.5 million outline, but that was an agreed not to exceed fee for that contract. As, as you see in the agenda item, it came in under that number, um, but that was the agreed upon fee for the county's consultant services. Mr. Chairman, sure, that was Robert. voted on by the board. Right, right. This was approved by the board. It wasn't unanimous, yes. but it was approved by the board. Right. So, right. so I mean, it, it was not some secret agreement. I mean, it was an agenda item that came forward to approve this um, agreement. Okay. All right. But the outstanding amount of the 500000 we didn't know about until the demand yes. letter in May requesting that for reimbursement or, or payment. And until the demand letter in May, we were not aware that there was a claim for repayment of those monies. But here it's clear that it was done in 2014. No. By, I mean, voted on by the board in 2015, not to exceed the 1.5 million. Well, actually, if I could go a little bit through the chronology without getting too deep, and uh, the $300,000 that was eligible to be paid was the threshold was probably realized in late or early 2015. The, the payments continued until July 2016. So that's when these additional payments would have happened. Then this board took action um, to make its own obligated payments for the remainder of the contract. So there's this interim period where the monies came out of the project bond funds and they were not eligible for joint funds, they were because the three hundred thousand dollars that was eligible to be spent jo on joint funds for the county's obligation was already spent. So, in terms of when we knew what, as of July 2016, we knew that the payments were no longer being made, and that's when this board took action to appropriate it. Okay. additional funds. Um, Chairman, Commissioner Cooper. Yes, and just in um, piggybacking off of Commissioner Burrell's um, statement, the settlement matter was introduced to the board yesterday in executive, where some of us still had questions about the 1.5 million due to Harry. Seeing in a contract and knowing that the 1.5 million is due Harry, I don't think is the question. The question is how we got to this point where it's appearing on the settlement contract. And that has to do with the disbursement of funds towards that amount obligated to Harry. And to th this moment right now, I do not see any written substantiation to show how the county is still obligated for the amount that the Braves are saying we owe them for he that Harry contract. I'm not sure what documentation would satisfy that. Even an explanation. This, to me, this is this is not even the correct form for us to be hearing an explanation of that. I would prefer to have it in writing and for it to be substantiated as to how we arrive to the point where they're saying that that is outstanding. Yes, I, I, I think you, I think now this is where Steve comes in to answer that question, I believe. Like I said, to me, I don't even want to have a conversation because too much of where we got today is about people talking. I would like to see it clearly documented how we got to arrive to this outstanding obligation that too many people were asserting that they did not know about. To me, there should have been a paper trail, something documented, something written. So to talk to me about it right now and you want me to vote on a settlement, the timing is off. I need to see something documented, clearly stated, so that every commissioner can walk away fully understanding how we got to that amount in the first place. Mr. Chairman. 
Commissioner Weatherford. Sure. Well, first of all, I think it's this board decision where we have the conversation, not one commissioner. So I, I think that I understand it, and I would like to reiterate what I understand, and you can let me know if I'm correct or not. This board, prior to my coming here, authorized up to $1.5 million for our program manager hearing. Correct. Of that, in the uh, stadium bond or the intergovernment or the agreement with the Braves and their subsidiaries, they were to pay up to $300,000 for that, of that one point five. Correct. At the end of the day, the contract ended up being only one point three and some change. Correct. Somewhere during the construction of that project, someone from the county authorized out of the proceeds from the bond through the Braves construction manager to pay Harry, which was in fact our obligation. Is that the, correct? The, the because board, it was not paid by us directly, it was paid through the construction management team that, building That the is state. correct. The, the requisitions that the Braves submitted against the bond fund included Harry's invoices up through the $300,000 and then an addition to that. Which That's is correct. where the 500K comes in that the, were paid out of the proceeds of the bond when it should have been paid from us directly because we're the ones that contract with them, not the praise. Is that pretty correct. much sum it up? Correct. Now, to Mr. Cupid and Mr. Burrell and everyone else's, we didn't know anything about this until, you know, we entered into this agreement or this dispute. Uh, but it doesn't, to me, the little fact that we owe the money to Harry because we obligate ourselves up to 1.5 and it was paid from a different fund when it should have been paid from our fund. And that's what we hear. Sure. And that, to me, that's the only issue. Other than that, uh, you know, now that we finally understand it, but we shouldn't have had to understand it yesterday. We should have had to understand it before we got to this point, which is our fault or someone's fault. But the fact is, that's where we are. It seems to me pretty clear. Um, you know, it was paid from one pocket, it should have been paid for the other pocket, and during the negotiation, the settlement of this, uh, this legal agreement between us and dispute, then we made that clear and correct. Yeah, I'll go down Mr. the table. Chairman. I'll go down the table. Uh, I'll let Commissioner Burrell and then Commissioner Rod. Um, and I don't think we're questioning that we owe it based on the, the contract, but yesterday you... Deborah and Steve, y'all gave us um, not really a time frame, but amounts like the seven hundred thousand that the Braves paid, and but we haven't seen the documentation, and, and that's what that's what Commissioner Cupid <coughs> is asking for, and I am too. When were those payments made by the Braves to Harry? Do we have a date, an amount, and a check number, or? documentation to prove that? Yes, ma'am. We, we have all of that and can well, provide it to you. Can we see it? <laughs> I mean, really. I'm, Mr. I'm, Chairman. I, I think it needs to all... He said yes, so hold on a second. Commissioner Rock. Um, we keep going around saying nobody knew. This board was informed that the Braves have been paying. No, we weren't told um, when they... Just let me finish, please. The, the board was told when the agenda item came last year that... Heary was still owed money and that the Braves were not paying it anymore because all of the bond proceeds had been used up. And so there was a dollar amount, I don't remember the exact amount, but they came in front of this board, an agenda item that said how much we had to pay to close out the, the uh, invoices with Heary. And so all that's happened between then and now is the actual reconciling of who paid for what. But this board was informed last year that there had been payments made by the Braves on the county's behalf and that the, and that the county still needed to pay Heary money because, Steve, did we not have an agenda item last year for that? Yes, sir. So, um, so this is not something that all of a sudden just showed up. And, and when the Braves ceased making the payments in, well, the agenda item was November 22nd of 2016. When the Braves ceased making the payments, they didn't ask for reimbursement for these funds that they are now asking for reimbursement for. Okay, so you're telling me you have the documents that, that Commissioner Burrell and Commissioner Cupid are looking for? Yes, sir. We have dates and check amounts. All right, so I'll account. tell you what. Let's take a recess. You drive down to your office. You can bring me back copies here, and we'll reconvene, and we'll continue this discussion. 
He's, she's, he's going to respond to your question. He's got documents. This is not the time and this is not the place. We just tabled a nonprofit agenda item for 850000 because people needed more time to look at one Excel spreadsheet that said where those funds were, what agency are related to. And you're telling me you want me to recess here? And look at this for the Braves. No, sir, this is not the time and the place for it. I, I, it would be my, it would be my motion that we table this matter for an additional two weeks until commissioners feel completely confident, completely confident in what is being proffered here. I would also agree that we that or support that we table this until we see the settlement document. I'm seeing a settlement agenda item, and I have not seen the settlement. We have not read the settlement. That has not been put before us, at least not before every commissioner. So why am I voting on this? No, I'm, I will not recess to look at this. Okay, so are you going to make a motion? I move that we table this item until the evening meeting so commissioners have enough time to look at all documentation substantiating this settlement, inclusive of the settlement documentation itself. Well, out of respect, I'll second your motion. Uh, let's discuss it. Um, Deborah, did you not send us the settlement document in an email last night? No, Is I sent you this agenda item, which has all the terms that would be contained in the settlement document, and, and, and it is a normal course of business Correct. in which you sometimes authorize us to finalize the documents, but that's okay. your discretion. It, is there a time frame for settlement that would prevent us from tabling it till the end of the month? Is there an issue with waiting two weeks till we get all the stuff in front, all the documentation in front of us? Not, not aware of a, a legal reason. Okay. okay. Then just, just the negotiations. M and, Mr. And Chairman, I just, you know, we have, we have staff here. We have an attorney who, uh, in my understanding, the reason the attorneys are not sworn under oath is because they cannot lie standing up there. And we've been told that the checks are out there that document that the Braves, uh, the claims that the Braves have made were paid the way that they made it. And so I just uh, I cannot support tabling it. Okay. I certainly have all the information I need and everything I ask has been answered. And uh, I have no reason to table this. I see everything I need and I rely on the attorney to develop this motion into a legal document that will be I'm sure scrutinized by both parties and make sure it is uh, binding and correct. And the fact is, if Director McCullers states that he has documents that say they were paid during the course of the construction bonds, I have no reason to doubt him either. So I have everything I need to make an informed decision. I'm not sure why others do not. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes, Chairman. I've been sure. here a little too long to see that we need to see everything pertaining to any agreement with this organization. There should be no word of mouth I agree on, I depend on for anything. That's how we got here in the first place. Also, to contrast this with the prior agenda item, which we tabled, we had every agency up here which could have provided whether any nonprofit substantiated the work that they do. We had them sitting here today, but we did not take time to do that which would have taken all but five or 10 minutes to do so. We tabled it for two weeks. So there, to me, I see a contrast to why we would not table something as important as this to ensure that we have every document in place to ensure that every commissioner can walk into this room with confidence knowing why we're settling this. Okay. I'm just waiting to see if there's any more discussion before I call the question. Which question? So Which we're, we're, the, if, we, if you vote yes on this, that means you agree to table the motion until the next, the next board meeting, right? Okay. Commissioner Cupid? Yes. Okay. If you, vote, if you vote against, if you vote no, then you don't agree to table it for two weeks. Okay. okay? So the motion is to table it for two weeks. That's correct. All right, with that, I'll call the question. Okay, it passes, it, it, it defeats three to two. So um, now the question I have is, how long can I legally recess this board today so that we can bring the documents to show to Commissioner Cupid and the rest of the board? Uh, 
a reasonable time. Okay, so how about, thank you, it's helpful. Uh, the, I think the burning question here is that I hear we, is that they want to be able to see that there were checks to cover this concern about the uh, the additional five hundred thousand dollars. And we may be able to have them right. emailed here. Uh, well, it's okay. The point I'm making is that seems to be the burning issue for most of the board. Are there in fact are there in fact paper documents that reflect that we legally you know wrote checks for five hundred thousand dollars and do we have a, do a paper trail for that? We, we have a spreadsheet that summarizes all payments made by the Braves okay. and all payments made to Huey from either the Braves or from us. Okay. It's just a spreadsheet. Well, as I understood, though, Commissioner Keeper would like to see the actual documents. The documents themselves. The There's more outstanding that you have yet to cover. Yesterday in executive session, there was vague if there was vague remembrance of the agenda item from last year for. Um, over $400,000 of which this county was to set aside for that. I have yet to even understand how that comes into play in any of this discussion here. I do not think you have enough time for a reasonable recess to explain that to me here today. Uh, so to me, whatever we're being tabled for, I just do not see it even, be, I do not see it being reasonable to address outstanding questions. I don't see it being reasonable for how we conduct business at our general board of commissioners meetings. So I tell you, I assert to you today, there is nothing that you can explain to me within this um, 11th day of September, um, enough information for me to vote on this settlement. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I don't see a reason to re recess if that's the case. I think we need to call the question, but I'll defer to anybody else because we've got a motion and a second on the table. We've had discussion and- uh, Well, I just wanna, I, make, I understand Commissioner Cupid's point. Uh, I just, Commissioner Burrell, if we showed you the spreadsheet, all right, would that address your concerns about the paper trail? To show where the payments were right. made and right. what's outstanding to match the, all this. Correct. And this agreement and, sorry, this agreement and the spreadsheet needs to be entered into the record. Um, and can we pull the agenda item from last year that shows what payments were done? We have that. We have that. And, okay. and this, this is, in fact, the spreadsheet. All right. So let's let's take a let's take a ten minute brief, a recess here while you bring and address this issue with Commissioner uh, Commissioner Burrell. Okay. And the, anybody the commission wants to see these documents. Anybody else? Okay, Commissioner Cupid. All right. Okay, go ahead. You want me to go? Okay. Um, everything that has just been discussed and shown to us from the agreement that was on, on the board before the recess, the agenda item from November of 2016, and the spreadsheet of all the payments uh, would like to be entered into the record. Um, and um, I know we can't uh, vote on this today because it's not an agenda item, but I still want to direct the or request that the board come back to appoint um, county manager and county attorney as a representatives for the Braves, and anything discussed has to come back to this board. I think we can make Maybe that appointment. A clerk's note or something. We can make that appointment next meeting, right? Yeah, next meeting. So we'll put it on the agenda for next meeting. All right. All right. Um, all right. So we'll take care of that with the next uh, next meeting, uh, Commissioner Burrow. Okay. okay. Thank you, Commissioner Cupid. Yes, I support Commissioner Burrow's suggestion as well. As I stated prior to our recess, that today I cannot support this settlement. I think we're in a deja vu circumstance of November of 2013, where everybody said, you have to do this quickly, you have to get this done now. And because of that haste, we end up in being in a very similar situation here today, where I'm, I'm just extremely curious why we would take matters that um, we typically discuss an executive and have that discussion during a recess to get this done today. There's something that, that just doesn't sit well with me as to um, what is going on here today. 
And for that reason, I, I can't be supporting this particular item. Okay, I'm just try, curious as to what what was discussed during recess that you think were, you obviously have some concerns there and you should, you should voice them, right? I support you on that. Again, I think for us, even as a board, to be having these type of discussions and recess from our board of commissioners meeting, it is atypical. It, it seems somewhat unprofessional to be having this discussion about the Braves in such a manner. It goes to show just how mismatched we have been with this organization to begin with. We're here, we're rustling papers, trying to figure out how to substantiate one line item in a settlement. And we could be taking time to flesh this so we can feel confident um, as a board and how we move forward dealing with a very big player that's here in our county. And it's almost as if the same level of haste, the same um, lack of, of um, organization with respect to that initial process is right here, it's being played out right in front of us today. And I just, it's, it's, it's very difficult to um, be supportive of how we are moving forward, having been a part of that process back when this uh, when this um, deal was first arrived in 2013. Ms. Chairman. Uh, let me let Commissioner Burrow, she, was, she raised her finger first, and then you, Commissioner Ott. I, I just wanted to add one thing that um, you, that this, this agreement or settlement today takes care of any other outstanding questions or debts or Anything. Legally, you can't do that. Okay. All other issues that were raised in either our demand, the counter demand, or our response are con considered to be totally extinguished, which includes every bit of the counter demand of over $5 million from the Braves. Thank you. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully disagree with Commissioner Cupid. Um, there is not a rustle. The only rustling of papers was our tremendous staff pulling out the documentation that they brought to this meeting. This is not something that they had to go find. Steve had the spreadsheet with him. Deborah had the agenda item with her. So this is not something that all of a sudden we had to kind of create or try to find. It was documentation this county had. Staff had it. They brought it to the meeting in case there were any questions because there were questions yesterday. And so I, I have a big problem with calling to question um, staff's organization. I think that they came very well prepared for today to be able to answer the questions that came up yesterday. I agree with you, Chair. Excuse me, if I can respond to the commissioner. I agree this has nothing to do with staff. I think it has to do with us as a board. The papers that they prepared for us today, it was because questions were asked of them right before I left yesterday that I still had um, pending our discussion in exec. I should not have to go hunt down staff before a 9 a.m. meeting. I should not have to recess during a board of commissioners meeting for us to discuss sensitive information, which we can discuss in exec. I should not feel rushed. I should not feel pressured to get answers that I have had outstanding from an executive meeting to rush on something of this magnitude. So you're exactly right, Commissioner. I, I commend staff. I commend staff for you rushing to answer the questions that, that the commissioners had. But what I'm very frustrated with is even when there were significant questions asked in exec, there were still some things that were still outstanding at exec, and you expect us within a 24-hour time frame to come back and be supportive of it. Okay, um, before I call a question, I just wanna say that, first of all, actually I wanna commend the whole board because we're here today with an agreement that we started out where people were saying they were, we owed somebody $5 million and now we're gonna get a check for $1.3 million. And that's because the board held its ground. This is one where um, we worked with a partner, all right, that's a business partner and that's how they see the world and I understand that, I appreciate that. We have, we have different um, standards that we have to go by here and we have to answer to the people. And I realize something like this is very controversial, but the bottom line is, is that we did the right thing as a board. We asked, we went back to our partner and said, look, we, we disagree with your point of view and we'd like to sit down and talk about it and let's see if we can't find a, uh, an outcome uh, that's, um, that's mutual to both of us. And I think this one does that. This wasn't something, you know, that uh, uh, we rushed into. This was many months of being patient and waiting and negotiating with them until we finally came around to a point of view that uh, was called compromise. Uh, James Madison 
said the three most important elements in any government are compromise, compromise, compromise. And we have found that, that middle ground right here that I think both sides are, gonna, are going to have agreed to if we vote on it positively today. And now we can move forward uh, and continue to build on this partnership, which has already shown that despite the controversial nature of how it was created, and we all know that I got the office here today because of it, um, we are finding a way to move through this and to look at this at a, in a, through a different set of, eye, of, of glasses and filters to see how this partnership can benefit the county uh, through all residents and all businesses. So with that, uh, I call the question. And it passes four to one with Commissioner Cupid in opposition. All right, so our last, um, our last agenda item is the one we move off consent, number 27, to discuss uh, uh, appropriation of the hotel motel tax funds. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. I have one item today. It is to approve an appropriation of the FY18 hotel motel tax revenues received in excess of the adopted budget to authorize a transfer of unspent revenues to the general fund to be applied against the Cobb Marietta Exhibit Hall Authority revenue bonds, series 2015 stadium bonds, debt service, ex debt service expenditures that meet the requirement per Georgia code. I want to be very clear before we go forward in this agenda item. This is the countywide hotel motel tax, not the special service $3 room night tax. Just to be clear, these are this is a very separate item versus the item we discussed last agenda meeting. Um, there was some confusion about that a little bit yesterday through some of the news media outlets as we kind of walked through this. Um, but what we're doing here is... As we bring in the money for the countywide hotel motel tax, it is shared between the county and the Galleria Authority. The Galleria Authority receives 62.5% of the total collections. The county receives 37.5%. From our collections, we pay the Performing Arts Center bonds debt service. Uh, we've also given a small contribution to Cobb Travel and Tourism of $40,000. That leaves $2.7 million approximately remaining. Um, we budgeted to transfer $1.7 million to go from this fund to the general fund to pay for the portion of the stadium bond debt service in FY18. By doing this transfer and approving this agenda item, we will reduce the general fund's contribution to the stadium bond debt service by over a million dollars. So that is what we're asking here today. And this, these monies do have um, some restrictions tied to them. They do have to be applied against expenditures that promote travel and tourism sorry, expenditures for activities that promote travel and tourism within the county. The debt service on the stadium bonds meets that requirement per Georgia code. Okay, so, uh, Commissioner Rott. Um, I just, I wanna kind of emphasize here. Um, Bill, don't you have, a, you have a... I do, I can put it on the screen. Yeah, we can put it on the screen, please. Yes, um, one of the things, and everybody refers to it as a baseball diagram back when the stadium was originally discussed. There was $950,000 of, um, back then it was, I think, referred to as excess hotel motel tax. Um, and one of the things that um, I pushed for prior to the vote on the MOU was that of the different funding sources, which you're seeing here, um, that before any of the um, other ones, except for the general fund, be reduced, that the general fund property tax needed to be reduced because that was what the citizens were paying. And so each year, as we move forward, um, as additional revenue comes in from these various different funding sources, um, the county's been able to reduce the general fund property tax. And as Bill said, going from 6.4 million in 18 um, down to 5.3 million, um, this is money that's being saved from the taxpayers. Um, and it's going into the general fund reserve. But it, I think it meets a commitment that this board said early on that there would be an effort to reduce the citizens' participation in the stadium debt, um, and this is doing that. So I'm fully supportive. Okay. Commissioner Burrell. Um, just one thing I'd like to make clear, too, is the amount going into the general fund, the reserves, the 1.056, um, would have to come back to this board as to determine how that's going to be distributed. It, we're not funding anything right now today with that reserve. 
it would have to come back to us for approval of how that's where that's going to go, whether it's additional debt service or travel and tourism or whatever. But it has it still has the restrictions of it has to be for um, specific activities that promote travel and tourism. It You're, still has that restriction on it. It does for this agenda item. The board could change those restrictions in the future. But yes, no matter what we do with those dollars, the one million fifty six thousand six hundred twenty five dollars, it would have to come back before the board to be used. Uh, we are asking at per this agenda item that it be designated for for travel and tourism. And that is a very broad category, but it, either way, it would have to come back for the board to make that designation to be spent. I think she's confused. Mm -hmm. She's not. Yeah. This is not Cobb. Tur tur this and is just be, a general category. And I, I want to be very clear because yeah, that's right. where it's confusing. Yeah, this exactly. is not Cobb Travel and Tourism <laughs> right. entity. Right. This is Cobb and Tourism activities within the county. Right. Because of the eight percent hotel motel fee, which is required right. for promoting travel and tourism. Exactly. Right, but this $1 million, yes. I mean, it says in the agenda, I'm consideration for that. This yes. is not being restricted to that because the general fund dollars are not restricted as the the $2.7 million, 8% hotel multi tax by Georgia code yes. is restricted. It has the two categories that were listed yesterday. Um, this other million dollars, it's in the budget. It right. can be used for anything. Absolutely. Now, it yeah. says in the agenda item that it would be considered to be used Correct. for travel and tourism purposes, but it's not restricted or required to be. That's correct. It and I, I think it needs to be made, made, made clear that well, the only thing that has a restriction is the $2.7 million that's from the 8%. The, mm -hmm. the million dollar savings to the general fund is not restricted money. That, that is correct, sir. Okay. It, it would ha the only restriction is it would have to come back before the board to be spent. Right. That is the restriction. And, and that was actually right. a result of the board last year expressing concerns they'd like to have more flexibility in using this money. Yes. And that's what we're doing now by doing what we're doing, putting the contingency fund We'll talk about it later on. Yes, sir. And that's because we have to have it obligated to somewhere before the end of the month. Otherwise, we lose it. Just the 2.7. Yes, right. sir. Exactly. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you. Yes, as we discussed yesterday, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we all had a consensus that since this was developed for travel and tourism, that maybe this would be a good place for this dollars to go and help increase the budget for even Cobb Travel and Tourism Board so that they can uh, actually bring in more revenue and uh, more tourists to the to the county. But that would be something we discuss at a later date. But my feelings is that this access money uh, at least be brought back to the board as a consideration to give that as our contribution to Cobb Travel and Tourism uh, Board itself. And uh, thereby even loosening the impact that uh, some of the hotel motel owners wanted to do and contributing to that, and maybe we can use that excess money for public safety in around the stadium. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Cuban. Yes, it's not reflected in the agenda item that the additional funds, oh, okay, it is that it said will be reserved in the general fund for future consideration on travel and tourism activities. So is that constrained or is that a suggestion? It is for consideration. So this is this is the, the most restrictive we can make it. So as we reserve it into fiscal year 19, that'll be the designation it is given. But like with any other reserve, it has to come back before the board for appropriation to be spent. It'll sit in the contingency account until the board gives direction to move it out of the contingency okay. account for a specific ex expense. Okay. I would just like to have a clerk's note that Commissioner Cupid supported this item as contingent upon us using the funds. As um, for travel and tourism activity in Cobb. Okay. Oh. So I don't go. know if you need a clerk's note, but I, I'd like one too. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there's two right there on this side. Maybe. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and then I'm going to go ahead and read the motion. All right. Uh, based on the recommendation, I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the appropriation of the fiscal year 18 hotel motel tax fund projected revenues. Authorize the transfer of unspent revenues to the general fund to be applied against the Marriott Exhibit Hall Authority Revenue Bonds, Series 2, 2015, stating bonds, debt service expenditures that meet the requirement of the, the official code of Georgia applied, annotated, 48-13-51, uh, authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary documents as revised with the uh, with the clerk notes, we have a second. 
Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Okay, uh, we have some appointments we have to approve. Find those. All right, uh, Commissioner Weatherford, I believe you have one. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask the Board of Commission to approve the appointment of Bill Jones to the Recreation Board post four for a term balance to expire on March 31st, 2021. Uh, this appointment replaces Gary Wolovec, who resigned, and we thank him for his service and many years of dedication to Cobb County. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. And you have a, another announcement, but Commissioner? No, sir. Uh, the Board of Commissioners announced the appointment of Dr. Kirk Underwood to the Animal Control Board, post five for the term balance to expire uh, December 31st, 2018. Uh, this appointment replaces Dr. Richard Best, who served on that board for many years and who's now deceased, and we thank him for his years of service and legacy to Cobb County Animal Control. Okay, okay and then uh, I'd like to announce the appointment of Barkley Russell to the 1% Special Local Option Sales Tax Oversight Committee of Post 1. And she replaces uh, Ray, Ray Higginbotham. Uh, may he rest in peace. He served the county for many years and his country for many years. And I uh, wish him and his family all the best. And also thank him for all his service to our, to his, uh, as I mentioned. So we have Commissioner comments, I believe, now. And I'll start with Commissioner Cupid. Okay. Commissioner Weatherford. Thank you, sir. Um, a few, but I think I'll reserve uh, those. Main thing I want to do is an announcement that the first responder appreciation day uh, from four to six today uh, at Lost Mountain Park, forty-eight forty-five Dallas Highway. Uh, there's food, drinks, giveaways, and DJs, and uh, all the first responders in the county are asked to join us from four to six in appreciation of all they do for our county, our state, and our nation. And on this special day of remembrance of those that lost their lives running toward the problem and not away, uh, we can't thank them enough. And this is one small way of doing that. So thank you. Commissioner Burrow. Yes. Um, I'd first like to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers September 11, 2001, and that those that sacrificed their lives um, and the first responders at the all the sites that were attacked. Um, and the county flags are at half staff, um, and I'm sure all over the country, as we remember 9-11, may we never forget what happened that day. <clears throat> Um, and also, this morning, at two of the proclamations were for Constitution Day. So I encourage you all to learn more about our Constitution, teach your children, and celebrate all next week our U.S. Constitution. Uh, this Saturday is the East Cobber Parade. Come out, and there'll be... Um, Lots of candy thrown out. The parade begins at 10 o'clock at the corner of Princeton Lakes Drive and Johnson Ferry Road. And um, at the end of the parade uh, on Johnson Ferry, at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church will be a festival with carnival games, painting, booths, showcase arts, and crafts. So come out and enjoy the fun in East Cobb. Um, on September 20th, the... Um, in an effort to reduce euthanasia rates and clear our local shelters, Cobb County Animal Services is proud to announce an exciting partnership with the home, Homeless Pet Clubs of America and the Cobb County Police Department. Uh, the partnership, which is a pet adoption and fundraising launch party, will take place from 6 to 9 at Red Sky Tapas and Bar at 1225 Johnson Ferry Road. And... The, um, all funds raised will be donated to the Animal Society of Cobb, which is the 501c3 arm for the Cobb County Animal Services. 
For more information, you can go to Cobb Animal Services on Facebook. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ott. Okay, uh, first thing, uh, some congratulations and welcome. Uh, Major Adcock was uh, promoted to Deputy Chief and is now assigned to headquarters over the Administration Department. He's leaving Precinct 3. Major Barry Little took over command of Precinct 3. He's coming from Precinct 5. Captain uh, Matthew Hurst is coming from Precinct 3 as the Assistant Commander and is now assigned to headquarters as Chief of Staff. Captain Ben Cohen uh, coming from Precinct 4 is the new Precinct 3 Assistant Commander. Major Batterton is still there. He's like the only one that's still <laughs> where he started. And then uh, newly promoted uh, Captain George Mestre, formerly of Precinct 3 Criminal Investigations, is the new Precinct 4 Assistant Commander. I'm just going to read the next one the way my assistant wrote it, because it's pretty funny. Just imagine that song all by myself. <laughs> Being such an understanding boss, I have granted my assistant's request for two weeks off. Her daughter is getting married, and she, her, she has family coming in from the California. The joke there is if you ever listen to Kim talk, every interstate has a the in front of it. Um, please be understanding that I may not be able to answer all emails and calls, but will try my best. That's because she's not there. Kim will be greatly <laughs> bold, highlighted, missed, but I'll do my best. For the next two weeks, please read my newsletter. They will be works of art done all by myself. <laughs> it always promises to be interesting. Um, the next one, I have a letter here from Speaker Ralston in the House of Representatives. Eddie, stand up. He hates when I do this. But I have a uh, letter here addressed to the members of the House of Representatives pursuant to House Bill 332. Um, this was dated on September 5th. Uh, Speaker Ralston says, I have today appointed the following members to the Board of Trustees of the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund. And our very own Eddie Cannon, um, who is Director of County Sport Services and President of the Georgia Recreation and Park Association. So congratulations, Eddie. Um, you've already heard about the big event in District 2 on Saturday from Commissioner Burrell. <laughs> Um, but what she didn't tell you, the more important thing, is the road will be closed. Um, it will be closed from 9.45 a.m. to 11.30. And those of you familiar with traffic in East Cobb know that that's a big deal. So just kind of keep that in mind. I believe, Commissioner Burrell, you'll be up on the front, right? I'll be she working is. with Representative Handel. So I won't be with you. No. no. Um, and then finally, Don't. along with the parade... <laughs> Friends for East Cobb Park, who you've heard lots about with the recent purchase of the Tritt property, um, who raised more than a million dollars with the purchase of the first land for East Cobb Park, they will be at the East Cobb Parade and they will be at the festival afterwards. And they are starting their countywide or community wide fundraising campaign to re replenish the Parks Endowment Fund. Um, so if you're out there, give them a donation and thank them for all the hard work. Thank you, Commissioners. And again, I just, uh, it's a very special day in our history. And I echo the words of all the commissioners here. This is a day we should never forget because people uh, you know, on that day gave, uh, gave all. So with that, we're adjourned.
Thank you.